What's up everyone, welcome back to a brand new video. So today's scenario I didn't really expect to do. It's kind of a weird request, but for some reason it's also very popular at the same time. I guess people really just like cooling. So obviously, a big trope with what ifs is people turning good. And I have done videos like that before. And I have done videos with Cooler before too, even one where he was the main plot of the story, with him being canon and all. Today's is going to be a mix of both of those. Even though I've done scenarios with Cooler in them before, I haven't done one with him turning good at all. So this scenario gives me two objectives. For one, I need to introduce him into the canon story. And two, I need to make him turn good somehow. But that's exactly what we're here for today. For this video, we'll set a like goal of 4,000 likes. If we hit that, I'll turn this scenario into a full series. And I'll continue with another part soon. Anyways, let's begin this story. So first, I'm going to change Cooler's backstory a bit here. I think this will fit him more in this scenario, and it'll make things more interesting as well as fitting him into canon easy. Obviously, this whole thing is a hypothetical, so it's not even canon at all. So we do have some leniency in terms of what we can do. So in this scenario, Cooler's going to be similar to his normal self, but also different in some ways. He's similar in the fact that he's free as his brother, and he's kind of separated from his family, partially on his own accord. And this isn't to say I'm making him a good guy. He's still a bad guy, but unlike his brother and father, he's not as obsessed with being evil and dominating places. But he still isn't great. He's evil for a cause. He wants to assert his presence and let people know not to mess with him. He seeks power, not in the sense of power over people, but power in terms of his own physical strength. Partially due to a hatred of his brother and father, he has something to prove. He's the superior one in the family. He's off in another part of the universe doing basically whatever he wants. He still has his armored squadron too. So as you can see, he's pretty much the same as he was normally, but there are some differences that'll make it easier for him to turn good here. I feel like if we use the original cooler, it would be pretty much impossible to make him good. But I feel that this is reasonable. So now the objective is to try and fit this into the main story. And that actually isn't too hard. So first we're going to be covering Cooler's Revenge. We're going to be placing this in the main timeline too. Everything on Namek goes the same, and this will happen during the three year time skip after Trunks came to the past. Let's say this takes place about a year after Trunks arrived. We're going to be adjusting people's powers too just to make it more interesting because obviously there's going to be some big differences from the main movie. After hearing word of Frieza's death, Cooler decides to head out towards Earth. This isn't to avenge Frieza or anything. In all honesty, he's kind of glad that Frieza and Cold are dead. But at the same time, he has other feelings about it. For one, he wanted to be responsible for killing them. That was a way to assert his dominance over them, show them who was really boss. Even if he didn't necessarily kill them, he just wanted to show them that he was the strongest. But also, this is out of self-preservation too. He assumes that someone may have been after Frieza. Apparently, the one that killed him was a Saiyan. He doesn't know much about the backstory and the events that led up to this, but he knows that a Saiyan killing Frieza is probably not good news. Maybe he's going to be next. Maybe if there's still Saiyans out there, they're hunting down Frieza's family, and he's next. And that's exactly why he needs to make a preemptive strike. He's heading there with his squadron now, and they say that he should probably just blow up the planet when he gets there, but Cooler says he wants a more personal introduction, and it would be more fun to have an actual fight. This is going to be a big part of Cooler in this scenario. One of the big aspects that we've changed about him is the fact that he wants to get stronger, and he does like fighting a lot. This is going to be very important later on. So remember that tidbit about him. And it's basically the whole reason that this is happening. Because if he were doing this out of self-preservation, yeah, that would be a good idea. Just blow up the planet and leave it. But besides the fact that he wants a good fight too, he needs to see these people face to face. He needs to know what killed Frieza. And he wants to personally kill them, not just blow up the planet. On Earth, everyone is in the middle of their training right now. They're still preparing for the androids. And we're not going to be using the anime's events and say that Vegeta's still on Earth too. Goku's training with Piccolo and Gohan, and he's surprised. He senses an odd energy heading towards Earth one day. It's very weird because it feels familiar. It feels almost like Frieza's. It's definitely malicious too, and he doesn't know what it is or why it's coming here. But it's definitely bad news, and it's not just one energy, there's multiple with it. The rest of the group catches on to this too. While the humans are training, they sense the same energy, deciding to go to Goku and Piccolo. If there's a threat coming to Earth, they might as well be together. And it's weird, they know they're expecting the androids, but Trunks never said anything about this. If there's another threat coming to Earth, Trunks definitely would have known, wouldn't he? I mean, it's kind of weird, he wouldn't have hidden this, so why is this happening? Did history already change by him coming here? They fly over to where they feel the ship's landing, and everyone's back together again. Even Vegeta shows up. Of course, he didn't know how to sense Ki until very recently, only a few years ago, but he can't tell that this Ki is familiar to Frieza's, and he feels like he still recognizes this presence. He puts two and two together, and he tells everyone what they're up against. Even though they killed Frieza and King Cold, there's still one more member in that family that they didn't kill. Honestly, Vegeta never expected him to show up. He's always been separate from Frieza, but he tells everyone, this must be Frieza's brother, Cooler. And from what he's heard, this guy's a different breed from Frieza. No one knows how strong he is. He might even be stronger than Frieza. And no one really knows what he wants either. It seems like they're just gonna have to find out. The ships land nearby. And first, they're greeted by three odd alien people. They strike a pose. This is Cooler's armored squadron. Great, they're gonna have to fight an off-brand Ginyu force. The good thing is Goku has access to Super Saiyan pretty easily. 
These guys don't seem too powerful. You might not even need Super Saiyan for them. But someone else steps up. It's Cooler himself. And they can definitely see the resemblance to Frieza. He introduces himself in his squadron. And he's glad that he has a welcoming party too. And quite easily he could pick out the people from the group that are Saiyans. Of course he would recognize Vegeta. Knowing the king and all, he looks just like his father. Even though he never got to meet him in person. But that other one, that guy wearing orange, he definitely looks like a Saiyan too. Now he asks, there's only two Saiyans here, not knowing about Gohan. And apparently a Super Saiyan was the one to kill Frieza. He wants to know, which one of them was it? It couldn't have been Vegeta, right? Goku steps up. He was the one to defeat him. Well, Trunks got the kill, but Goku did still defeat him. He doesn't mention that though. So that's the Saiyan he's looking for. What, is he here to avenge his brother or something? And Cooler says no. He never really cared for Frieza or Cold. Actually, he kind of hated them. He was just seeking a strong opponent. He wants to improve himself. And even though he is scared of the Super Saiyans, he doesn't reveal that's part of the reason why he's here. He tells them, a Super Saiyan might have been enough to defeat Frieza, but it won't be enough for him. The squadron goes and attacks, splitting up and fighting the rest of the group. They attack everyone besides Goku. And Goku sees what's going on. Cooler wants to fight him one on one. And immediately, the two clash. Cooler's surprised. So Goku's not gonna use his full power yet. Can he even go Super Saiyan at will? And Goku chuckles. He doesn't need it yet. He can tell that Cooler's not as strong as he thought. He's surprised. He did know Cooler was Frieza's brother, but if he's only the same strength as Frieza, that's not gonna be enough to defeat him. Cooler then hits Goku with a powerful punch. He tells him that's where he's wrong. He's much stronger than Frieza, and this isn't his full power either. Just like how Goku can transform, he has another. But it seems Cooler doesn't need to use that yet either. They might as well have some fun first. Meanwhile, the rest of the group is fighting the squadron. The three of them together is actually enough to hold off the group. But quickly, they come to realize what they're up against. Our heroes have Vegeta and Piccolo on the team. Both are incredibly powerful, and Vegeta tells them they're mistaken if they think they could win here. All of a sudden, their group has the upper hand. Their squadron might be too much for the humans to handle, and even a little too much for Gohan, but Vegeta and Piccolo won't be defeated that easily. The tide begins turning in that battle, as well as the one between Goku and Cooler. Their battle is incredibly explosive. It's good that they're in a secluded area, but Cooler begins showing off more of his power. Goku jumps up in the air, flying down towards Cooler with a punch, pummeling him into the ground. And as Cooler is pinned down, his eyes begin to glow. He shoots lasers at Goku, which he narrowly avoids, and as Goku jumps back, Cooler grabs him with his tail, slamming him into the ground. Cooler then jumps up, stepping on Goku, jumping off him and then up into the sky. He lifts a finger up, beginning to charge an attack. What a pity, he expected more of a Super Saiyan. He flings the attack down, and Goku counters with the Kamehameha. He begins pushing it back, but Cooler puts more power into his attack. It's too much for Goku to handle, but as Goku fires his attack, a new aura starts surrounding him. First it's his legs, and it works up all the way towards his head. He's encased by a golden key, and then transforms into a Super Saiyan. He tells Cooler he's surprised. He really didn't expect him to be this strong, but in Super Saiyan, he's definitely not going to be an issue. And now the fight is a one-sided beatdown. Goku completely overpowers Cooler. But Cooler reminds Goku, does he remember what he said before? This isn't his final form. Unlike Frieza, he has one more beyond this. Another form, even stronger than anything that Frieza had. Goku knows that this might be trouble, and he continues fighting Cooler. But mid-battle, Cooler's key begins increasing. Dramatically, actually. Goku's hitting him with a flurry of kicks and punches. But the punches, they stop doing damage. Cooler grabs one of Goku's fists, throwing him back down to the ground. And he watches as Cooler begins to transform. The rest of the group looks on as well. They're just finishing off the armored squadron. But the squadron begins chuckling. Bowser laughs. Now they're really screwed. Angrily, Vegeta kills them off, looking up into the sky and seeing as Cooler transforms. You should feel honored. You're the first, and soon to be the last, to witness my ultimate transformation! It's terrifying. He's growing larger. A crown begins growing on his head. He looks incredibly intimidating, and he descends down into the ground, saying only one thing. Well then, ready to kneel? Goku doesn't really know what to expect. He can tell that his power increased a lot, but they could still win this. He tries fighting, but the attacks are doing nothing against Cooler. Cooler smiles. Now it's his turn. His smile is covered by a mask on his face, and he hits Goku with an incredibly strong attack. This is bad. This guy's actually incredibly strong. How is it possible that this guy exists? How is he stronger than Frieza? Vegeta's equally surprised too. He didn't know about this. Cooler's been secluded for so long, and he wonders why that even happened. But it's also weird that he's here. He jumps into the fight too, and he begins questioning Cooler. He said he doesn't care about Frieza, so why is he here trying to avenge his brother? Cooler says it's not that. These stupid Saiyans don't listen. He's here for a good fight. He wanted to challenge the Super Saiyan, but Vegeta says it's definitely not that. If he's so set on finding a Super Saiyan, Vegeta questions him. Maybe he was scared. Was that it? Cooler tells Vegeta he's an idiot. Why would he be scared of that? Look at it now. He's fighting Goku and winning. But Vegeta could see right through Cooler. He wasn't expecting to win. He came here just to see it. He wanted to do a preemptive strike. 
and he only just got lucky. Yeah, that's it. He feared that the Super Saiyans were going to hunt him down. Goku tells Vegeta to stop. He's only going to piss off Cooler more and more. And Cooler then turns to Vegeta. He lunges his hand out, grabbing him. With his other hand, he launches a blast at Goku, knocking him far away. He tells Vegeta to stop questioning him. Just let him fight Goku. Why is Vegeta so impatient? Does he want to die right now? But Vegeta continues acting cocky. He's laughing, mocking Cooler. He was scared. And this does piss Cooler off. He plunges Vegeta right into the ground. Why is he so confident? Look at his friend. His friend is the Super Saiyan, not him. What's with this attitude? Vegeta should be silenced. And he begins mocking Vegeta too. He should stop acting so high and mighty. He's not a Super Saiyan, is he? He's just another weakling. That's why he fought the squadron. He tells Vegeta he's a nobody. He stomps on Vegeta. He's worthless. He was never a Super Saiyan, and never will be. He's not even worth Cooler's time. He points a finger at Vegeta, and Vegeta says he's wrong. Now Cooler's starting to piss him off too. He's not a nobody. He's the prince of all Saiyans. He's a survivor. And he will be a Super Saiyan. With Cooler's foot still on him, Vegeta begins powering up. Goku launches over too, hitting Cooler with a punch and catching him off guard. Vegeta then stands up, beaten and angry, and Goku looks on confused. There's no way. Vegeta's enraged. Cooler's right. He's not a Super Saiyan, but he will make himself one. And if he doesn't, how is he going to make it out of this alive? He's been training towards it for so long, and still he couldn't axe it. Somehow Kakarot did, but he couldn't. He doesn't want to admit it, but Cooler was right. An explosion of Ki occurs, and Cooler watches on, a bit terrified too. What did he just do? He doesn't believe his eyes. He just created another Super Saiyan. Vegeta's surrounded by gold and key as he powers up. His hair is golden too. He told Cooler that he was wrong, and now he's going to show him the error of his ways. Goku's surprised and also kind of excited. Another Super Saiyan? That's awesome. The two of them team up together, fighting Cooler alongside each other. Briefly, Cooler is able to hold them off. But as Vegeta gets more and more used to his power, it gets tougher. And even though Goku's ahead of him in terms of strength, Vegeta's still not weak by any means, especially now that he's a Super Saiyan. The two of them together are completely overwhelming Cooler, and Cooler decides he has no other choice. He's had his fun with this fight, but he may as well end this. He'll blow up the planet. That'll finish them off. He won't have to worry about Super Saiyans anymore. He tells them it's a shame. He would have loved to fight them again, but it has to end like this. He uses that same attack from before, charging a supernova up in the sky. It's launched down towards the surface, but Goku, Vegeta, and everyone else jumps in front of it. And it's easily deflected, going right back towards Cooler, exploding mid-air. Cooler gets injured by his own attack, then falling down to the ground. How could this happen? If only he didn't get so cocky against Vegeta. Vegeta got under his skin, and that only snowballed into him getting under Vegeta's skin, causing him to turn Super Saiyan. Cooler could have won this. He could have defeated the one Super Saiyan, but two, no way. He's injured, and he stands up. But if this is where he dies, so be it. He's not going to go out without a fight. Vegeta walks up to him, ready to kill him. But Goku steps in front of him. Cooler's surprised. What, does Goku not want to kill him? And Goku says that's exactly it. Vegeta asks what he's doing. He's an idiot. They need to kill him right now. But Goku says maybe not. I mean, they are going to face some really strong people in the future anyways, right? The androids are going to be coming soon in a few years. Wouldn't it be nice to have an extra person to fight alongside? And a new training partner too? Vegeta's confused. What is he insinuating? Goku powers down, looking at Cooler. Something's different about him. Even though he's similar to Frieza, he's not exactly the same. He kept talking about how he wanted to fight someone strong. In a way, he's kind of like Goku. And he did only come here out of self-preservation. He was scared of the Super Saiyans. He thought he'd be killed by them. But Goku says they were never out for him. They didn't even know Cooler existed until now. And this actually does come as a shock to Cooler. He might have not needed to come here at all. And Goku looks at Vegeta too. They spared him after all. And look how that turned out. Same for Piccolo. Maybe Cooler can change. Cooler doesn't even know what to think of this. He feels kind of insulted. But also, he doesn't necessarily oppose it. Angrily, he jumps up into the sky, then flying out of Earth, not saying anything or doing anything. They ask Goku why he did it. They should have just killed him now. He's going to come back later even stronger and kill them. But Goku says not to worry. He could tell. Cooler's not like his brother, and he's going to come back soon. He could see it in the look on his face. He was considering what Goku said. He agreed deep down. And even though he wasn't showing it now, maybe they just found a new ally. Immediately following the fight with Cooler, everyone on Earth eventually heals up. Thankfully, no one actually died. A lot of people were pretty beaten up, but Goku, Vegeta, Gohan, and Piccolo took the most of it. With the humans suffering some injuries from Cooler's squad, Vegeta's still confused as to why Kakarot would even think of sparing Cooler, as is everyone else. They're unsure if it's wise to let him go. It's already too late, obviously, and they don't know why Goku ended up doing it. But some of them eventually start agreeing with him, mainly because of something Vegeta says. Vegeta still hates the idea of working with Cooler, but he does confirm that Kakarot's right. Cooler isn't as bad as Frieza. He was never involved with the Frieza Force anyways. And again, it sickens Vegeta to just even think about working with Cooler. But Cooler didn't really seem like Frieza. Everything Vegeta said to Cooler was true. He was probably only doing it because he was scared. Who knows though, he might not even return at all. 
maybe he's gone for good. And just like the last time, Goku's still not too concerned about it. Either Cooler doesn't return at all, or he'll actually return and try and join them. Cooler only seems to want to get stronger. This would be the perfect place for that. No one really knows what to expect. Jiro's drones keep surveying the area, collecting data for Cell too. They do end up learning about Cooler, but they don't actually need his DNA. First of all, unlike Frieza, he's not a mutant, so his DNA might not even benefit Cell much, as opposed to what Frieza's did. And also, they already do have enough data for Cell anyways. So we've covered everything that's been going on on Earth, but what about Cooler? What is he up to and where did he even go? Well, he's not really anywhere right now. He's just out in space flying around aimlessly, going to different planets and even training a bit. He already feels stronger, not just from his training, but from that fight. Only because it was his first battle in a while, but he got some good experience from it. He's already recognized that he won't grow as fast as Frieza did. Frieza was a mutant, and he's not like that. But still, Cooler recognizes his insane potential. Even if it's not as crazy as Frieza's, it's still there, and he's gonna take advantage of it. And with all this time out in space, especially to himself, he does a lot of thinking. He does want to get stronger, but why would he devalue himself and train with those people on Earth? Not to mention, they killed his squad. He should be mad about that. Well, even though he was the one to attack them. But still, it's the principle. But Cooler never really cared for his squad anyways. He keeps on training from time to time in space, and he really has nothing to do. He could go back to his old ways. Or maybe he could take the space of Frieza, starting a new Cooler Force maybe. But that doesn't seem right. He's not like his brother, and he doesn't want to continue their legacy. He's going to start something anew. He's going to be different. Not that he's going to be a good person, not by any means. Well, at least not yet. Cooler is already having a change of heart. Don't mistake this for him being a good guy already. This is going to be a slow process, and we're not going to see it fully happen in this part. But Cooler could already tell he's becoming different. And with more time to reflect alone in space, he eventually decides that maybe he should go back to Earth, at least to fight everyone. He doesn't need to go back there and join them and train with them. Instead, he could just go back and fight them. And once he's there, he can go with the flow, see how it goes. Maybe he could have some fun. Remember, Cooler's main goal here is just strength. He wants to be strong, and he wants to have a good fight. As opposed to Frieza, his motivations are more like Cells or even Goku's. Eventually, he does end up back on Earth. And it's been a lot of time since he was last there. One morning, he lands in the middle of nowhere. He knows how to sense power now too, so he's able to locate everyone. It seems they're all grouped together. They're all flying towards somewhere. This is perfect. They're all in one spot. He could have another fight just like they did last time. He chases them down. As the groups all flying together, they're confused. They sense a presence behind them. It's a familiar malicious presence. It's Cooler. This is terrible timing. Cooler is able to catch up to them, landing nearby in front of them, announcing why he's here. He's back. He wants another fight. And he tells everyone not to worry. Even though he's a lot stronger, he might spare them this time and show some mercy. Even though he lost last time, he's still going to be cocky about it. Everyone's a bit concerned or annoyed about this, and he wonders why they're reacting this way. He knows he showed up out of nowhere asking for a fight, but this will be fun for them too. But as he's making his statement, he suddenly hears explosions behind him. The group says that he arrived at the worst time. This is the exact morning that the androids are arriving. This is bad. They have to deal with Cooler and these androids. Goku asks Cooler, does he remember what he mentioned before, those strong fighters that were going to show up in a few years? Cooler vaguely remembers it being mentioned, and Goku says they were just about to fight those guys. The group's surprised that Goku's acting so nonchalantly about this. But again, this is pretty much like he predicted. He's not too nervous, and he tells Cooler, if he wants a good fight, why not try and help against those androids? Cooler is intrigued. If these fighters even concern these people, they might be strong, but he says he's not going to team up with them. Goku tells Cooler though, if those androids win, he's going to have no one here on Earth to fight besides them. And if Cooler really wants to test out his powers, they'll be a great target for that. Cooler's conflicted, but he accepts it. He does remind Goku though, He's fighting the androids on its own accord. He doesn't want to consider this a team-up. But Goku is right. He doesn't want those androids to kill these Saiyans and the other people on Earth. They were fun to fight. And he can also get some fun out of this too. Everyone heads to the city with a new person alongside them. It's kind of weird with Cooler there. He's incredibly intimidating and everyone keeps distance from him. What a weird dude. Also, they have no idea where Vegeta or Trunks are yet. But Trunks should be arriving from the future soon. They get in the city and they can't sense anything. Everyone's already evacuated out of fear. And as for the androids themselves, they can't sense anything from them. It must be because they're mechanical. So they're going to have to look around manually. Hopefully they can try and ambush the androids. Cooler tells them this is boring. He has a much better idea. He lifts up a single finger, and everyone barely is able to jump back in time. He swipes his arm in front of him, raising the entire city. The good thing is, he didn't kill any innocent people in the process. But it's not like Cooler would have cared anyways if he did. He did just destroy an entire city too. They tell him he didn't need to do that. But he says, look, he found the androids. 19 and 20 are standing there, kind of on guard, but also a little bit injured. They weren't expecting that either. Jiro is terrified, and 19 jumps in front of him to protect him. Cooler's here. Why is he back on Earth? 
He thought that Cooler left for good. He watches as Cooler then steps up to fight 19, and it becomes pretty apparent that Cooler is way ahead of the android. The rest of the group watches on kind of amazed. You know what? They could probably sit back and let Cooler do some of the work for them. It would be nice, too. Even though Cooler is way ahead of 19 in terms of strength, 19 is then able to steal some of his energy. He's a bit confused at first, but then realizes what's happened. This guy just drained his energy a bit. How annoying. He grabs the arm that 19 used to drain his energy, ripping it clean off. He then proceeds to use 19's own arm to beat him. Although he does feel a little bit weaker, maybe he's gonna need to transform to actually put some fear into these androids' hearts. Or CPUs, or whatever. He powers up, and the group watches on as Cooler transforms. They really hope that Cooler doesn't target their group, because he's clearly a lot stronger than before, and he seems pretty annoyed right now. He's flattered that 19 admires his strength so much that he wants to steal it, but this fight's gonna end here. He expected a more interesting battle, not something with gimmicks. Quickly, he obliterates 19. Jiro is just standing there completely flabbergasted. This all happened so fast. The entire city blew up because of Cooler and he found them. And then he kills 19. The fact that Cooler's here too is huge. Why is he here? Jiro has no idea what to do, but then decides to attack Goku. And Goku begins fighting him, going into Super Saiyan. The good thing is, Goku is a bit stronger than normal here. He did have the experience of Cooler's fight, and after getting a Zenkai from that, he got a little bit stronger. And even without that, he would have been fine in this battle. But there is one big issue. The heart virus eventually does kick in around here. Meaning the battle's cut kind of short. Tony is about to kill Goku, but then Vegeta jumps in, ready to fight Jiro on his own. Jiro tries to think of what to do next. He has to think quick. Maybe he could take on Vegeta. That might work. The thing is, he actually knew that Vegeta was a Super Saiyan, since they saw it against Cooler. But Jiro then feels a sharp pain in his leg as Cooler shoots a death beam right through it. He jumps out of the way and Vegeta does too as Cooler launches an attack. Vegeta asks what the hell he's doing. Stop interfering, let him take this fight. And Cooler says he's taking way too long. He'll kill this android just like the other one. Jiro is able to create a distraction, then using it to get out of it, escaping the area. The group is pretty ticked off at Cooler, but they don't express it because they fear what he might react like. Well, Vegeta doesn't care. He calls Cooler an idiot. They had that android right there. They were just about to kill him. And Cooler says clearly not. Vegeta was taking way too long. Did he even know that android had the abilities to steal energy? It would have been disastrous if he got Vegeta's power. Cooler did him a favor, if anything. The two of them keep bickering like children. And since these two are going to spend so much time annoying each other, Piccolo decides that he's going to lead the group next. They just need to wait for Trunks to show up and see what to do. Piccolo tells Cooler he has to stop acting like this. They aren't going to fight him. He knows that Cooler wants to have fights right now, but that's not their concern. Their concern is the androids. If he wants a fight, help with that. Help fight those androids and stop getting in the way. Cooler talks back to Piccolo. Remember, he's not their friend. Don't insult him. Vegeta tells Cooler to stop acting so tough. He came back here for a reason. Just like Kakarot said, Cooler actually missed that. How cute. He came back all the way just for that. He wanted to fight them, train alongside them, and now he wants to help them. Cooler reminds Vegeta, that's not true. He's not their ally. And as they continue arguing, Trunks eventually shows up. And immediately, he doesn't know what the hell's going on. He sees Vegeta standing there arguing with someone that looks very terrifying, but is also acting a bit childish right now. He doesn't feel immediately threatened at first, but then he asks Piccolo who that is. Piccolo says that's Cooler. He doesn't know about him? Trunks says no, he never met anyone named Cooler. But he does look like, wait, no, 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 that's not right. Why does he look so similar to Frieza and Colt? Piccolo's surprised. Was there no Cooler in Trunks' timeline? This is Frieza's brother. Frieza has a brother? And he showed up here and not in his timeline? Oh no, that's bad. Trunks thinks that going back to the past must have changed this timeline. And then he hears about the androids and this further supports this theory. He doesn't know that the timelines are actually two separate ones. But now he's seeing how different the two really are. He's filled in on everything, and Cooler even gets to meet him. Vegeta has a son? Why wasn't he at the fight? It's a long story. They'll explain to Cooler later if he really cares that much. Okay, so what do they need to do now? Trunks says that the other androids might actually be here. They fought 19 and 20, not 17 and 18. There was never any 19 and 20 in his timeline. But this is concerning. They might actually have to find out where the lab is. They're gonna have to find where Jiro went, and they need to stop him from activating 17 and 18. Cooler's a bit annoyed by all this. He just wanted to have a fight. But whatever, if this leads him to stronger people, he'll join them again for a bit longer. Although, all he's really interested in is Goku. He wants to fight that guy again. So, while he's incapacitated, he'll have to do this for now to occupy himself. Jiro ends up making it back to the lab. And by the time everyone locates him, it's already too late. He's already activated Android 17 and 18. The rest of the group converges on this area, watching what's happening. Like normal, 17 and 18 even awaken 16. While also killing Jiro in the process. They're gonna do their own thing and hunt down Goku. And it seems like they already have some company. They have a lot of people to fight here. This should be fun especially Cooler. From their data, they can tell that he's pretty strong. He might actually be a bit of a challenge. But everyone else, well, the androids aren't really too scared of them. The 
The androids do try and leave, but they're forced to fight anyways. Alright, they'll just kill everyone here and then find Goku on their own. A battle breaks out and Cooler's hyped up. He transforms once again. Those first two androids weren't too hard to face. Obviously, these two seem a bit stronger since they killed 20, but Cooler isn't too concerned. Cooler tries to face 17 first, as the rest try and take on 18. Cooler hits 17 square in the face with a punch. It briefly knocks 17 back, but he turns around and smiles. That didn't hurt him too much. Damn, Cooler were sure that that would take off his head right there, but again, that would probably make the battle not as fun. So maybe he subconsciously pulled that punch. He punches more and more, and he begins trading blows at 17. 17 is actually pretty entertained by this. Of course, you can tell that Cooler is below him in terms of strength, but this will actually be a fun battle. It won't just be a one-sided beatdown. He tells 18 to handle the rest. He'll fight Cooler alone. Cooler asks if 17 can absorb energy like the other androids, and 17 says he can't. Good. Cooler hates those gimmicks. This will be a good old-fashioned fight. Cooler launches a death beam at 17. He puts a hand up quickly blocking it. He launches more and more beams, and 17 speeds up his hands, trying his best to block every attack. And eventually, the attacks stop hitting. A barrier forms in front of 17. With the barrier still in front of him, he uses it as a barricade to ram Cooler with, knocking him back into a nearby cliff. The cliff explodes and crumbles as Cooler steps out of it. He lunges towards 17, grabbing him and throwing him into the ground. He then feels a sharp pain in the stomach as 17 kicks right up into it, throwing Cooler up into the sky. 17 launches himself off the ground, going above Cooler, and then spiking Cooler down into the ground. 17 wipes a bit of blood off his face. Wow, Cooler might be stronger than he thought. Meanwhile, everyone else is fighting 18. With everyone there, they are able to hold her off a bit, but they're not doing much damage. They're basically just preventing each other from dying. Vegeta's definitely having the best shot here. As you could probably guess, since he got Super Saiyan earlier on, and he got that Zenkai from Cooler's battle, Vegeta is stronger than normal, so that does make a difference here, but not too much to the point where they can defeat 18. 16 just watches on silently, observing everything. As the fight between 17 and Cooler continues, Cooler's getting a bit confused. He has been doing damage to 17, but he's not getting tired at all. And he asks about this, and 17 simply responds by saying that he has infinite energy. Nothing he could do could tire him out. Cooler might have been a bit close in terms of power, but still, 17 did have the advantage, and since he has infinite energy, eventually he'll be able to win pretty easily. But Cooler doesn't back down. He keeps trying to fight, even though it doesn't really accomplish anything. And eventually, 17 ends up being the victor here, beating Cooler unconscious. He's about to kill Cooler, but then he hesitates. That was pretty fun. He tells 18 that he had a good time. 18 standing around the rest of the fighters who are all injured and can't fight anymore. She's a bit jealous. 17 definitely had way more fun. Ah, whatever. They'll leave these guys alive and fight them later. That at least leaves some fun after they kill Goku. The three androids head off on their journey to find Goku, as the rest of the fighters over there try and recuperate somehow. Vegeta's completely frustrated and decides he's going to go off on his own and become stronger somehow. He'll figure out a way to defeat the androids, and Cooler. In his anger, he launches off randomly, and Trunk tries to chase after him. Krillin then walks over to where Cooler is. Is he dead? Nope, this guy's still breathing. Great, they're going to have to keep dealing with him. Cooler wakes up. He's surprised. He lost, and he's still somehow alive. Krillin's a bit concerned as Cooler gets up, thinking that Cooler's going to attack him next. But Cooler knows what he wants to do. He will stay here. Until he defeats those androids, he won't be pleased. That fight was the most fun he had in years, maybe even more fun than the fight with Goku. With Goku, Cooler had the advantage for a bit, but here, Cooler wasn't the one with that advantage. And that made the fight fun, it made him push himself even more. He'll get stronger in his own way and defeat those androids. And eventually he'll be able to fight Goku too. Krillin just watches on confused. You know, for an evil and reckless guy, he seems pretty similar to Goku. It's weird, but kind of entertaining. Maybe it'll be good to have Cooler on their side. It seems he's much more tolerable than when they first met him and still way more tolerable than Frieza regardless. Everyone is currently off on their own right now. Piccolo heads to the lookout, and since Cooler has no idea of where to go, he just ends up following Piccolo. Piccolo's not really sure why he's going, but he can't really get him away. Cooler just watches on as Piccolo and Kami fuse on the lookout. That's pretty cool, and it seems like Piccolo actually did get a lot stronger too. Piccolo says this might help them fight the androids. With his new strength and Cooler's help, they could probably defeat 17 and 18. But before they go to find those two androids, they actually find another one. Piccolo senses an ominous key, and Cooler ends up sensing it too. Piccolo feels the key of so many others in there, and Cooler's surprised too. He senses Goku, Vegeta, even Frieza, along with some others. Piccolo's concerned, not sure what to expect, while Cooler's pumped up. This means there's going to be another good fight. The two of them go back down to the surface. Piccolo's surprised that Kami even let Cooler get up there. But now with Kami part of him, he can kind of see Kami's thought process. Cooler's actually warming up to Earth, and he actually doesn't seem like a threat right now. If anything, he's an asset. Of course, he may not fully be on their side right now, but he has a common goal of defeating the androids, even if it's for a different reason. The two arrive on the surface, and they then encounter Cell. Great, there's another android, and this one seems way different than the others. Cell is equally surprised to see them. 
Seeing Piccolo is one thing, but who is this other guy? He doesn't recognize Cooler. This is Cell from another timeline where Cooler didn't show up. This guy looks kind of like Frieza. He assumes he has some sort of relation. And this really does change things for Cell. He has no knowledge of this enemy and what he could do. He realized that he might be in trouble here. Piccolo and Cooler begin to fight Cell. Piccolo is a lot stronger now, obviously, but Cooler's also pretty helpful too. The two of them together are actually more than enough to overwhelm Cell, and he's not too sure what to do. He's about to die here, and they learn a couple things about him. First of all, they learn who he is and why he's here. This is, of course, before they fight. Even though Cooler wants to get right out of business, Piccolo's able to get this information out of Cell, and then the two start fighting. They also learn of his regeneration. During the battle, he's injured to the point where he realizes he needs to use this. And since he is part Piccolo, they assume that he probably did have this too. And they're about to kill him, but at the last moment, he performs a solar flare, blinding both of them and escaping. Damn, they almost had him. But at least they did get info out of him now. He actually seems like more of a threat than the other android, so they need to keep an eye out and make sure he doesn't do anything bad. Meanwhile, Goku finally wakes up from the heart virus. He's cured and ready to join everyone. He's also filled in on what's happened so far, and he's actually pretty amused to see Cooler still here. He actually has the perfect idea of what they need to do now. If they're kind of strapped for time, there's a way to make it so that time isn't an issue. They could utilize the Room of Spirit and Time. Vegeta and Trunks are the first to go in, and Vegeta immediately has one thing on his mind. Of course, he does want to get stronger and defeat the androids, but also, he wants to be strong enough to defeat Cooler. He doesn't want Cooler to stick around anymore, and Trunks is confused. Yeah, Cooler's kind of weird and he is Frieza's brother, but he doesn't seem to act like Frieza. He hasn't tried to kill them yet. Vegeta explains more and Trunks learns about Cooler, but Trunks is still a bit conflicted. It seems like the whole reason he came to Earth was because he was worried about Saiyans hunting him down. Of course, he is the bad guy here, but he's been helping them so far against the androids, and he hasn't actually killed anyone here. And he reminds Vegeta, what was the reason he came to Earth in the first place too? This kind of pisses Vegeta off, but yeah, he has no response for this. He just knows that once he's strong enough to do it, he's gonna kill Cooler as well so he won't have to worry about him anymore. Outside on the lookout, the rest of the people are waiting. Goku and Gohan are gonna go in next. And Cooler plans to head in with Piccolo. But Cooler's kind of bored waiting here, also being a bit impatient. But once they learn of the fact that the androids are gonna be going to Kame House, which Cooler doesn't know what that is, the two of them head down to there. And just as they expected, right when they arrive to the house, they see the androids there as well. Thankfully, they can't send Cell anywhere nearby. But they still gotta be careful. He could be lurking about anywhere, and if he gets a hold of the androids, it will be bad. But this is their opportunity. Piccolo and Cooler could kill 17 and 18, before Cell even gets a chance to get to them. They lead the androids away to a remote island. And Cooler's elated. He finally has a chance to fight 17 again. Of course, he knows he probably won't be a match for him. But after healing up from his past experience, and the fact that he even got more experience at all, he did get a bit stronger. If you remember from the first part, I mentioned that in this scenario, Cooler does have some great potential, even if it's not as great as a mutant like Frieza. So he has gotten a bit stronger and feels confident about this. But Piccolo steps in. From what he could tell, 17 seems like the stronger one. And just to be safe, they should probably switch fighting partners. Cooler can go fight Android 18. Interesting. Well, whatever, this actually will be fun. He doesn't know what she's gonna fight like. Maybe it's gonna be the exact same as her brother, but either way, he's just hoping for a good battle. Piccolo's fight with 17 commences, and at the same time, Cooler begins fighting 18. But 16 is immediately concerned. He realizes that Piccolo is not the same as before, and also, Cooler's power has grown, but it's already too late to stop the battle. By the time he notes this, the two battles have already started. And obviously they do know of the infinite energy by now. So that's why they're going full power right from the start. They feel that if they do this and get an attack in right away, they'll be able to kill the androids before they get tired out. If the battle goes on for too long, the androids get the advantage. But if they stop it right here and right now, that won't happen. But Piccolo has a better idea. He tells Cooler to work with him. They're matching the androids in power, but they can kill them if they work together. If they both focus on one at once, they could take them down one at a time. Damn, Cooler was kind of enjoying fighting 18. But whatever. After all, 17 shouldn't get away with embarrassing him before. There is a big issue though. He and Piccolo don't really have any synergy at all. They fought together once before, and it was an enemy that was much weaker than both of them, especially combined. This is a much more intricate battle. At first, the two of them are able to catch the androids off guard. They didn't expect to go 2v1. The two attack 17 at once and actually injure him a bit. But once 18 joins in, the tides completely turn. They have infinite energy plus perfect synergy, and they switch up and try to attack 18 instead. They did at least get to injure 17 a bit, which does briefly hold back the androids. But now it's a 2v2 and the androids have the advantage. But in the middle of the battle, Piccolo stops. He senses someone else nearby. It's the same person they sensed before, Cell. Of course, the androids have no idea what's going on. They think Piccolo's just bluffing. But he tells them to get as far away from here as possible or they get absorbed. 16 yells out the same thing. And all of a sudden, Cell pops up. He jumps up in the air and immediately tries to absorb one of them. And it's already too late. He gets Android 18. Now they're really screwed. Piccolo tells 17 to get away right now. And he actually does consider that for a bit. But he's also pissed off. Seeing 18 get absorbed, he wants to kill Cell now. But Piccolo says he's going to be no match for him. 
Who knows how much stronger he's gotten with 18 absorbed. And Piccolo then realizes what kind of situation he's in. Great, he's teamed up with a bunch of enemies. Obviously Cooler's there, and now 17 wants to fight Cell too, which means 16 wants to join as well. But hey, at least there's one good person nearby. Up above he sees Ten Shinhan, who briefly is able to hold Cell off. And this actually does help them a bit. He's using a lot of energy, but before he uses too much, the rest of the group takes advantage of the situation and jumps in. They just need to make sure that 17 doesn't get absorbed. But when fighting semi-perfect Cell, they realize that they're not going to be able to do anything to him. They keep trying to fight him, but nothing's working. It might be time for him to show off some of his true power. He puts a hand out, charging a blast. His first target will be Cooler. He doesn't know how strong he is or how much of a threat he is. So it's good to eliminate the unknowns first. Cooler gets ready to defend against it, knowing that he's not going to be able to dodge it at all and Cell is just going to move if he moves. Cell launches the blast, and just as it's about to hit Cooler, he vanishes. Cell's confused, and he looks around. The rest of the people vanish too. Piccolo disappears, 17 disappears, and 16 even disappears. Ten's looking on from above with no idea of what's going on. But then someone pops up behind him. It's Goku. He knew that things were getting bad down there, so he teleported everyone away. He puts a hand on Ten's shoulder and looks down at Cell. No words are exchanged and he just teleports away, leaving Cell completely alone. Everyone's back on the lookout. Wait, he brought the androids up here too? He says there's no better choice. He couldn't just leave them here with Cell. They can't let him attain perfection. Immediately, 16 and 17 are on the defensive, thinking that they were led into a trap. Of course, they also see Goku there, and they consider killing him right now, especially 16. But Goku says he knows what they're thinking. But consider the situation that they're in. If they kill Goku right now, as well as everyone up here, what do they expect to do against Cell? Are they just going to be on the run forever until 17 gets absorbed too? The point is, everyone has a common enemy right now. It's Cell. He tells 17 to think more about it too. Doesn't he want to save his sister? This is his best chance at that. The thing is though, 17 is actually part human, so it's a bit easier to convince him. 16, not so much. He takes this opportunity and tries to kill Goku, but he's stopped by Piccolo and Cooler. And surprisingly, even 17 stops him. 16 asks what he's doing, but 17 says that Goku's right. Who cares about Jiro's objectives? They need to save 18. 16 doesn't really care though, it's hardwired into him to hate Goku. He launches towards Goku once more ready to attack. Goku teleports out of the way, and everyone then restrains 16 once again. 17 actually has an idea. He tells him to attack his head, and together, Cooler and Piccolo launch an attack right at 16's head, opening it up and exposing his circuitry. 17 tells 16 sorry as he reaches in, grabbing his circuitry and shutting him down. They could reactivate him later, and probably even reprogram him, but for right now it's best to do this. Not long after, Vegeta and Trunks exit the room of spirit in time, completely confused as to what's happening. This is great for Goku and Gohan, they could finally head in now, but Vegeta's just confused as to why everyone's up here. Wait, is that Android 17 as well? Piccolo gives an explanation. Great. Now they have three enemies up here. He still doesn't trust Cooler, obviously, and of course he's not going to trust 17 at all. At least 16 is temporarily deactivated. It's one less android to worry about, but he tells them it doesn't matter how strong Cell is right now. He and Trunks will be enough to defeat him, and Trunks is equally shocked to see 17 up here. But it's weird, seeing a more human side of 17. Of course, he is only just concerned for his sister right now, and maybe later he'll turn on them. And not to mention, Piccolo and Cooler are more than enough to keep him in check right now. He just hopes 17 doesn't try and act up or anything. Vegeta flies down to the surface, with Trunks following close behind. It doesn't take long for them to find Cell. Cell's not sure where everyone went, but he continues looking around, causing chaos. In one of the nearby islands, he launches an attack. Everyone in the city watches as a big red ball of energy comes towards them, and suddenly, it completely dissipates. A combined attack from Trunks and Vegeta erases it. Vegeta then jumps up into the sky, and Cell's amused to see him here. Vegeta's just as happy too. This will be a perfect way to test his new power. He starts charging up energy and transforms. Not only into Super Saiyan, but beyond that. He shows off his newest evolution in power, Super Vegeta. And this actually does terrify Cell. Immediately, it becomes apparent that Cell can't do anything here, and it looks like he's not going to be able to find 17 either. He even tries to appeal to Vegeta's ego. Doesn't he want to see Cell become perfect? And maybe that would have worked in another scenario. But here, it's not. 17's nowhere nearby. They're not going to willingly bring him to 17. Plus, Vegeta says he already has enough villains to worry about. He doesn't need a fourth one around them. And as much as he does enjoy the fight and embarrassing Cell, eventually he does finish it. He does know about Cell's regeneration too, so he makes sure to erase every little bit of him. They thank Piccolo and Cooler for that. And just like that, Cell is completely defeated. Super Vegeta takes the victory. But then Trunks realizes something. Okay, this is good and all, but won't 17 be pretty pissed at them? He did kill Cell, but that means he also killed 18. Vegeta says whatever, he'll just kill 17 as well. Isn't that what Trunks wanted? Well, Trunks isn't entirely sure. 17 and 18 here seem much different than they did in his timeline. Even from their first fight, he could tell. And to be fair, they haven't done anything wrong yet. The worst they've done so far was fight the group, and they didn't kill anyone either. 17 right now is on their side, and he also did help fight Cell too. Vegeta's amazed. Is he seriously thinking about sparing 17? Trunks tries to think of what to do next, and the two of them head up to the lookout. They tell everyone that Cell's been defeated, and of course 17 wants to know what happened with 18. Vegeta's about to speak, but Trunks steps in. They didn't know any way to separate her from Cell. 
so she did die along with him. But he has one idea of how to fix this. Once Goku gets out of the room of spirit in time, maybe he'll be able to go to Namek and get some Dragon Balls. They do need to revive everyone killed by Cell so far anyways, and that would bring back 18 as well. 17's of course a bit pissed off, but at least that helps explain it. So what about 16? Everyone decides it's best for Goku to come back first. So they wait around, and wait some more, and more. Eventually Goku and Gohan finally come back. They're told about everything that's happened so far, and everyone's surprised to see them in Super Saiyan, acting so casually. Goku is kinda bummed that he won't get to fight Cell, but hey, at least he and Gohan access this new realm of power. So what do they do now? Well, Krillin suggests that maybe they could reprogram 16. Instead of destroying him, what if they had a good android on their side? Oh yeah, that might actually be a good idea. Goku says to take him to Bulma. But what about the Dragon Ball situation? Now with Piccolo and Kami Fuse, they don't have any. He has the perfect idea. He teleports away, and not long after he comes back with Dende. He introduces everyone to Earth's newest guardian. Some time passes and everyone arrives back on the lookout, and Shenron is finally created. Two wishes are made. One, they need to revive everyone killed by Cell. And Shenron confirms that this also includes Android 18. Everyone is still of course concerned about the androids, but Krillin has a better idea. He tells Seventeen, they should wish to not be androids anymore. If they truly want to get rid of Dro for good, this will be the best option. And he actually does make a wish, but it's different. He wishes to have the bombs removed from inside of them. He at least thanks Krillin for the idea though. It's weird seeing the androids act so casual when they are trying to kill them before. Especially for Vegeta who doesn't even want to see any of this. Why are they sparing all these people? He turns to Cooler, stretching a hand out and charging an attack. Cooler turns to his final form, ready to confront Vegeta, even though he might not be able to do anything against him. But Goku then steps in the way. He tells Vegeta to let Cooler go. Hasn't Vegeta seen how Cooler's helped them so far? And he knows that Vegeta as a Saiyan would like to have good fights with people. Cooler's the perfect person for that. They can keep him around. He can get stronger. He can train with them. Just look at the androids. They watch a similar thing happen with Seventeen. Cooler is definitely selfish and rash right now, but think about it. Has he tried to kill them so far? Vegeta says that's a pretty low bar, but just like Trunks, he reminds Vegeta of where he started. Remember back to when Vegeta first arrived on Earth, or hell, even Namek. And look how Vegeta's changed right now. Vegeta still is a bit uncontrollable at the moment, but he's definitely way more tame than where he was before. Angered, he puts his hand down, flying off once more for solitude. The androids go off on their own. As for 16, he's fully reprogrammed and rebuilt, finally becoming a good android. He stays there and he's going to kind of act as a new training partner for everyone. No one has any idea of where 17 and 18 went, although Krillin does want to see 18 again. They still had that same interaction before where she kissed him. Trunks eventually returns back to his timeline, saying goodbye to everyone. Thankfully with this newfound strength, he should be able to kill the androids there. Sadly, unlike the ones here, he knows that there's no chance of them reforming, but it still was interesting to see the differences in this timeline. And he wonders if Cooler exists in his. Well, he guesses he has to find that out for himself. He goes back to his timeline, and Cooler says he guesses he's going to stay here from now on. And even though Cell and the androids are gone, he still does want to use that room of spirit and time or whatever. He's hyped up, and he tells someone to join him. Of course, Vegeta isn't, and Goku and Gohan already had their time in there. But Piccolo actually takes him up on this offer. He did kind of want to train in there as well. And since the two are a similar level of power right now, it might be beneficial for both of them. Cooler then flies off, and Piccolo then chases after him. Cooler has no idea where he's going. Vegeta just looks on disappointment, and Goku and Gohan look on smiling. It's weird to think that that guy's Frieza's brother. Who knows what a year in the room of spirit and time with Piccolo would do to him. Not just in terms of power, but his mind. Cooler and Piccolo begin their training in the Room of Spirit and Time. Cooler was really looking forward to doing this. Sadly, he's not going to be able to test out his strength against Cell. But still, fighting against Piccolo should be good enough for him. After fusing with Kami, Piccolo got a lot stronger. So Cooler's pretty hyped up to train with him. And even though Piccolo's really strong right now, he comes to learn the insane potential of Cooler. Even though it's not something like what Frieza had, it's still really great. Cooler's growing exceptionally fast, and he's getting exceptionally powerful. Having this power on their side will be amazing. The two of them exit the room of spirit and time much stronger than before, and Cooler is immediately ready to fight someone. He wants to face off against Goku again, just like he promised. The good thing is it's clearly under much better circumstances this time. Cooler's not going to go out of his way to kill Goku, but hey, if Goku's up for a fight to the death, Cooler won't oppose. Of course, Goku doesn't really want to do that, but having an all-out battle should be fun. Goku shows off Super Saiyan Grade 4, ready to finally get to use it against a worthy opponent. Cooler's not too sure what's different about it, but Goku explains. And Cooler actually can sense a great difference in power. At first, Goku's confused as to why Cooler's not transformed, but Cooler says he doesn't need to right now. He's even powered up his base form. But as the battle continues, he says he will bring out his final form. The two begin clashing, and immediately it's clear that Goku's ahead right now. And the thing is too, he's fighting completely efficiently. With Super Saiyan Grade 4, he's not losing any stamina like he was before with regular Super Saiyan. But he does know that Cooler is way stronger in his base form. This is interesting. He wonders how much he's grown in his final form. And Cooler could tell that he's not getting anywhere with this, so he eventually does transform. And much to Goku's surprise, Cooler's actually stronger than him. 
and not only has his strength improved, but his technique has improved. He's learned some moves from Piccolo too, as well as a better fighting style. Instead of just being brutish strength before, he now has a little bit more finesse in his moves. It's incredible. The two have an all-out battle, and both are pleased by it. Goku can see how strong Cooler's grown, and vice versa. And most importantly for Cooler, he actually wins here. And not only shows how much he's grown, but the fact that he's finally beat Goku after all this time. It really gives him an ego boost. Vegeta doesn't believe it. Is Cooler really that much stronger? He wants to test for himself. So, Vegeta even fights Cooler, going full power as well. And if Goku couldn't win, Vegeta's definitely not going to win here either. Vegeta also ends up losing against Cooler. They weren't aware that Cooler had this kind of power within him. If this is what he could do with a year of training with Piccolo, imagine what he could do with more intense training, especially over a longer period of time. The potential of his race might be even more than that of the Saiyans. And who knows, maybe he can even access a new form sometime soon, something beyond his final form. And now, we can enter a time skip into the Buu Saga. Over the seven years, a lot does change. Vegeta ends up having a two-way rivalry with Cooler and Goku. He wants to be better than both of them. His distaste for Cooler actually makes him a lot closer to Goku, if anything. And even though he doesn't really like Cooler too much at first, he eventually does kind of warm up to it. He doesn't end up showing it too much, but he does trust Cooler way more than he did beforehand. And this is mainly because Cooler chills out a lot. Of course, even in the Cell Saga, he still wasn't as bad as before. But after all this time on Earth, I think it's safe to say he's finally turned good. First of all, he's actually made some friends, mainly Piccolo and Goku. And oddly enough, he's a surprisingly good uncle to Goten and Gohan. Vegeta doesn't really want him around Trunks too much, but eventually there's not much he could do. And based on what he saw from the other Trunks before, Cooler's pretty fond of this Trunks as well. Cooler even gets his own gi, surprisingly enough. He doesn't end up wearing it much because whenever he transforms, it just rips completely off. But it's cool to have something that's matching everyone else. He never realized what he was missing out on, all that time out in space before him. Not only was he weaker out there, but it wasn't as fulfilling out there. Here, he's growing a lot stronger, and he's feeling a lot more content with himself. Even though he wouldn't admit it before, he does like being on Earth and all these people that he met. Originally, he did just come here for a fight and to train, but that's changed. Now he actually lives here, and he's also reminded of his brother. This is what Freeze has been missing out on too, as well as King Cole. No wonder the two of them lost to everyone here. They were going about life all wrong. Eventually, we reach the end of the time skip, and now we can actually head into the Boo Saga. Besides all the changes that I just expressed with Cooler, not too much else is different. Besides the obvious fact that Goku's also alive here. Really, the biggest change I could see is that probably all the Saiyans would be stronger. Goku's influence and even Cooler's influence would mean they're both stronger, as well as Vegeta and Gohan getting stronger too. Gohan does still become the great Saiyan man though, and eventually everyone gets recruited into the tournament thanks to him and Videl. In terms of the tournament itself, not too much is going to change here either. One of the regular contestants would be kicked out in place of Cooler. But it is the Buu Saga. Cooler's not even going to be able to fight because the tournament's eventually going to be interrupted. And he actually notices something pretty odd about one of the contestants, the one that ends up facing Piccolo. That outfit and that appearance. The group notices him staring at that guy, and they're wondering what's going on. Cooler says he's never actually seen one in person, but from what he's heard about, this might be a Kai. A Kai, like King Kai? No, 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 a Supreme Kai. He knows of the different gods ruling this universe. For example, there's Lord Beerus, whom he doesn't mention here just to not freak everyone out. But he also does know about Shin, or at least he's heard about him. Why is the Supreme Kai here, if that's who he is? Once Piccolo comes back from the fight, that just confirms it for him. Shin and Kabuto are actually pretty surprised to see Cooler too. They know of him because they know of Frieza. It's odd to see that his brother's here and he's actually good, maybe? But there's also good Saiyans here too, so that's not really too crazy. And once Bobovich and Yamu attack Gohan, they're all filled in about Majin Buu. So that's why the Kais are here, and Cooler of course knows about Buu as well. Frieza heard of him from King Cold, so it's not really too weird to say that Cooler might know about him too. Just like how he knew about Lord Beerus. Majin Buu is here now? Well, thankfully he hasn't been revived yet, but that's what they're trying to do. Those guys that just took that energy from Gohan, they're trying to take it to Bobbidi in order to revive Boo, so they need to stop him right away. Since Cooler has heard about Boo before and knows that he's big trouble, he's actually up for stopping Bobbidi right away. And the rest of the group joins in as well. Cooler is actually a bit concerned, which is weird. The group's never seen Cooler acting like this before. Usually he'd be stoked at the potential of a nice fight, but he explains what he's heard from King Cold. Shin and Kibito both confirm this too. Cooler's always known that if Majin Buu ever showed up, he shouldn't mess with him. His power is leagues beyond where he and Frieza were. Even at his current strength, he's not too sure if that would be enough for Majin Buu. And this puts it into perspective for Goku and Vegeta as well. If Cooler's concerned, what are they gonna even do? They're weaker than Cooler. I mean, they are strong, and actually stronger than they were in canon. But if the strongest guy in the group is worried about Buu, yeah, that's cause for concern. They need to stop this right away. And immediately as they get there, Cooler begins making quick work of everyone. They're surprised at the initiative he's taken. First off, he goes to attack Deboer, making the fight as quick as possible, even killing him right away before he even goes back into the ship. Bobbidi begins panicking once he sees Cooler here, retreating back into the ship as quickly as possible as Cooler begins barging in. Cooler goes around destroying the rest of the minions. 
making the fight as quick as possible, blowing the ship apart and trying to find Bobbity. Everyone else just watches on. It's weird to see Cooler panicking like this, but hey, he's making quick work of this, and maybe it'll actually turn out well. At least, they expect so. Bobbity knows that he's in a corner. He needs to try something new. He already got a lot of energy from Gohan, and he's so close to getting Boo revived. He has more than half the energy he needs. He just needs a little bit more. But how can he do that? His minions are dead, especially his strongest one, Deborah. He's gonna need a new one. And that gets him thinking. That guy that's attacking them right now, Cooler. Bobbity looks into his mind. Something's off about him. He wasn't always good. And with his panic state right now, his mind is actually unguarded. This gets him thinking. He begins looking around and sees that deep down, Cooler was actually pretty evil before. It's kind of a long shot, but this is his only chance at actually reviving Boo and staying alive. So, Bobbity begins trying to possess Cooler. Cooler begins feeling strange, and Shin and Kabito watch on concerned. They ask him what's happening, and Cooler grabs his head. He doesn't know. He feels like someone's attacking his mind. He can't describe what's going on, but he's in pain. And they know what's happening. Bobbity's trying to possess him. And unlike Vegeta, Cooler's not doing this willingly. He's actually trying to resist here. But as I mentioned, with the panic state he's in, Bobbity's able to take advantage of this to try and manipulate him. Plus, Cooler's evil nature is way easier to bring up than it was for Vegeta. It's only been dormant for a few years, and his evil nature was pretty strong before. Bobbity just needs that to resurface, and he'll win. Cooler then powers up too, trying to resist it as much as possible. But he needs more power. He can't resist it with just this. Even his final form isn't enough. He shouts, and then a massive explosion occurs. The entire ship is blown apart, with everyone flung outside once again. They look down and see a massive crater, with Cooler at the bottom of it, and he slowly begins rising up. He's surrounded by a darkish aura, and he has that same evil grin he had before when he first came to Earth, as well as an M on his head. Bobbity's done it. He successfully possessed Cooler, creating Majin Cooler. And again, I want to stress that Cooler didn't do this willingly. He was almost able to resist it, but Bobbity was able to take advantage. And Shin and Kabuto realize this. They say that Goku and Vegeta need to fight him. He'll be too dangerous if he's controlled by Bobbity. But also, there's a chance at saving Cooler. He was resisting before, and that means maybe he could break free of it himself. They need to get through to him. Not only do they need to hold him back physically in a fight, but they need to figure out a way to beat him mentally. Piccolo and Gohan try talking with him, and Cooler's definitely not talking as he normally would. He's loyal to Bobbity, which makes no sense. Cooler would never do that. This definitely wasn't something that he succumbed to willingly. They need to get to the Cooler that's actually in there. But then they remember from before, maybe if he powers up more, he'll be able to resist Bobbity's power. They need to fight him and push him to break his limits. If they can get him to power up even more, then maybe Cooler's true personality will shine through, overcoming Bobbity's mind control and allowing him to break free of this curse. The four of them all team up. They know Cooler's moveset, and they know he's strong, but with their combined effort, they should be able to actually help hold him off. And that's the great thing here. Unlike Majin Vegeta, he doesn't want a 1v1. He's ready for anything. Cooler then launches into battle, with everyone reminiscing on how they first met Cooler. This is just like that first time he came to Earth. It brings it all back, and it really shows how much Cooler's truly changed, and it just gives them more of a reason to try and save him right now. While they all clash with Cooler, they even try talking with him. Goku and Piccolo try to get through. They're the two that are closest with him. Gohan as well. He knows Cooler's not like this. Remember all the times they've been training together. Remember all those peaceful gatherings and feasts that he's had with his friends. And most importantly, remember who the people in front of him are. They changed his life, and he changed theirs. Cooler can't destroy this place. He's expressed it himself. He regrets not coming here earlier. He was always glad to have found Earth, and they need to bring those memories back to him. They're not getting through to him at first, but they notice as he fights, he begins hesitating a bit. Maybe it's working. Cooler's holding himself back, but he can't do that. He can't hold himself back. They need him to show more power. Even though it risks reviving Boo, he needs to break his limits. He needs more power to overcome that control. As mentioned before the time skip, he was looking to even go beyond his final form. Maybe this will finally be what pushes him to, a need to actually ascend it. They are going to have to use some brute strength as well. With the four of them fighting together, they're able to hold off Cooler pretty well. Completely overpowering him, this pushes Cooler back. He's being attacked both mentally and physically right now. And this puts great stress on him. He needs to awaken something new. And as the battle goes on, his aura begins changing. That darkish aura from before, it begins going away. It starts becoming more normal, going back to what it was like for Cooler before. And then Cooler stops mid-fight. He's struggling. They can't tell what's going on, but he's just standing there. His aura flares up once more, but this time it changes again. It's an odd metallic blue aura. And then Cooler starts talking to them again. No, wait. He's talking to Bobbity. He's telling Bobbity he won't let him control him. He won't let him destroy Earth using his body. And he won't let Boo get revived. He needs to protect everyone here, and he's going to win this battle. Bobbity's watching from his ship. He can tell he's losing control. He tries fighting for more power, but it's not working. Cooler's overcoming him. The aura around Cooler begins flaring up even more. And then another massive explosion of power occurs, followed by a blinding light. They're looking at Cooler. He's glowing. It's almost hard to look at. 
both from a combination of his own aura and the sunlight reflecting off him. It almost looks like he's pure white, almost like how he looked before but a lot shinier. But as the aura dissipates, they could see him more clearly, his skin. It's almost a platinum-like color and also incredibly shiny. There's also some other minute differences with his final form, but most importantly, the M on his head is gone. He's done it, he's broke free of Bobbity's curse, but also, he's accessed a new realm of power. He's never seen this before, he could feel it, it's very strong but also very draining. So this means they've done it, they stopped Boo's revival, right? Well, not really. The ground begins rumbling around them. It's already too late, they've given off far too much energy already, but there was no other way. Cooler than it looks behind him terrified, Back to where the ship was, from the crater, someone rises out of it. There's a giant pink man there, with Bobbity on his shoulder. It's Majin Buu. He's been revived, and Bobbity thanks everyone. How funny. They broke Cooler out of his curse, but they were still way too late. Buu's already been revived, and there's nothing they can do about it. But as Cooler feels the power coursing through him, he says it's not true. He doesn't feel scared of Buu anymore, especially seeing him now. Sure, he can sense Buu's power, and it's great, but he tells Bobbity that what he did was a big mistake. He forced Cooler to get a new power to break free from the curse, and now his power is way higher than before. He apologizes to the group for getting possessed in the first place, but he tells them it's not too late. With their combined power, as well as the power of this new form of his, Majin Buu can and will be defeated. Cooler points a finger towards his friends, asking them to join him, and then he swings around, pointing at Bobbity. He'll witness their combined power, and most importantly, he doesn't know what to call this form, so he just wings it. I took inspiration from both Metal Cooler and Golden Freezer and we have a pretty simple and obvious name for this form. Cooler then looks right at Boo, telling him to witness the power of Platinum Cooler. Cooler immediately jumps in, ready to fight Majin Boo, and he could tell, this guy's tough. Even in his new Platinum form, he can't tell how strong this guy is. The Kais watch on, and Bobbity does too. They're all equally surprised. Cooler's power is actually maybe enough to challenge Majin Boo. They don't know for sure, but as this fight goes on, they'll get to see more of this power displayed, and maybe he can defeat Majin Boo but they don't know for sure. Boo can regenerate, and he's not worried about energy right now. And at first, it seems that Cooler might actually have an upper hand, but something becomes apparent very quickly. Cooler is a bit injured right now. He was just in a big fight, and that wouldn't be an issue if he weren't out of energy. And that's the thing, he's lost a lot of energy here. Besides that fight that he just took part in, he's also in this brand new form that he's never used before, and it seems to be incredibly draining for him. He has no idea of how to get control of it. Even though the power is insane, it seems like it's a little too much even for him. They need time, he needs to be healed up, and he needs to get some more energy, he needs to figure out a way around this, and he's definitely not going to do that in the course of one battle, that's going to take a while, they need a temporary solution here, something that will help them get ahead of Boo. The team tells Cooler he could rest, they'll take it on from here, maybe they could hold off Boo just for a little bit, Kibito could heal Cooler, and maybe then he could try and use some of his power. So that's what they do, everyone else jumps in to fight Boo, and together, they're actually enough to hold him off, maybe even overpower him a bit, but still. This is all of them collectively, it's not like one of them is going up against him. It's not a concentrated amount of power, and Boo can regenerate. They're also a bit tired out from their fight, and a little bit injured too. Boo doesn't have that disadvantage, he can keep healing, and he can keep fighting no matter what. This is definitely going to be their most fearsome opponent yet, and they can see why Cooler was so terrified of him being revived. Cooler knew that Boo would be powerful, but he didn't know he'd be like this. He apologizes again to Kibito and Shin, but no one's mad at Cooler. It wasn't his fault, he didn't intentionally get possessed, that was out of his hands. So, Kibito heals him, and even though he can't heal him fully, it should be enough. It heals his injuries and it restores a little bit of Cooler's energy. Cooler's ready to give this another shot. He knows that if he powers up into this form again, his energy is going to drain really quickly. So he wants to make his attacks count. He needs to hit Boo with a powerful barrage of attacks in the least amount of time possible. Before all his energy runs out, he needs to at least use it to try and defeat Boo. Cooler jumps back into the fight, and the group is glad to see him back. Boo's actually having a lot of fun with this too. He's laughing and having a lot of fun, and it's making Bobbity mad. He should be taking this seriously. He actually is facing some fierce competition right here. With all these Saiyans together, combined with Piccolo and Cooler, he's actually concerned. Even with Boo revived, he can't believe it. Before he was trying to act confident. Once Cooler transformed, he was trying to pretend like it was nothing. But it seems like this actually might be a big deal. He commands Boo, kill them now, stop fooling around. So, Boo starts to use his full power. And it's not just his full strength that's a big deal. He's also intimidating in terms of his magical ability. They gotta be sure to avoid his candy beams, or else they'll be eaten by him. Cooler begins delivering a barrage of powerful attacks, and he is actually doing a lot of damage to Boo, but it's still not enough. Whenever he attacks, he can't destroy every little bit of him. And it's pretty strange, whenever Cooler attacks too, it's like he's shifting in and out of Platinum. The power of this form is great, but he can't control it at all, he can't even remain in it. The group watches as Cooler is rapidly flashing, he goes between his regular final form and his Platinum one, 
It's like he's in between her right now, it's kinda odd. They tell him they'll back him up, and some of them even begin lending power to Cooler. First, it starts with Gohan. He knows he can trust Cooler with his power. And it's not like Gohan isn't confident in his own strength, but he thinks that his energy will be better in Cooler's hands. Piccolo agrees, lending some of his too. Goku's about to and Vegeta refuses, but Cooler looks back. He can't have Goku and Vegeta give their energy too. He needs at least some powerful allies. If Gohan and Piccolo are giving all their energy to him, they can't fight now. He still could use the support in numbers. And even so, he looks back at everyone. He expects better from them. They're kinda shocked to hear this. Why is he talking back like that? They're acting like they're backed into a corner now, but he tells them they can win. They defeated him twice after all, once a while ago and once today, even with his huge power-up since then. He reiterates, he expects more from them. They could win this, and they could do it together. They will defeat Boo. More energy is lent to Cooler, and Gohan and Piccolo are completely drained. Cooler's gonna have to make a massive attack. He's worried though. If this hits Earth, it can completely destroy it. He needs Goku and Vegeta's help. They need to get Boo secluded. They need to get him up in the sky somehow. And also Cooler sees an opportunity right now. Quicker than Bobbity can even react, he lifts up a single finger, launching a death beam right through his chest. Now Boo is on his own, not being controlled by Bobbity, and it seems like he can't really think for himself. He knows Boo doesn't really seem like the most competent fighter, so they could take advantage of that. Without Bobbity there, they'll be able to trick him. Goku and Vegeta nod at each other. They tell Cooler they'll try their best. They begin attacking Boo together, just trying to hold him off, getting him far up into the sky. Cooler begins charging energy, going back into Platinum, trying to use as much power as he can. The strain on his body is insane. He's never felt something like this before. The power is great, but it hurts him. And he's even getting tired out from it. But still, even with all those downsides, he knows this will work. He begins charging one of his signature attacks, a supernova. But this one, it's different. It's bigger than normal, and it's not the normal orange color that they usually see. It's an ominous bluish purple. Gohan and Piccolo watch on with amazement, as do the Kais. He's only just begun to charge it up, and the power in it is insane. They can see why he's worried about destroying Earth. Before the power leaves his body, he's gonna lend it all to this one attack. As long as it hits Boo, they should be good. This will kill him. Supernova isn't even a fitting name anymore. That's way too small in comparison to what Cooler's actually using right now. Cooler's a simple man, and he wants a cool name. He'll call this a Hypernova. An upgraded version of that same attack, with all of his power from his platinum form within it. And just to make it easier to maneuver, he begins shrinking it down too. The power gets concentrated more and more. He's straining, but it's working. He turns to Gohan and Piccolo. Get Goku and Vegeta out of the way now. They fly up, giving a signal to Goku and Vegeta. Everyone backs off from Boo. He's standing there midair, and notices that there's a bright light illuminating everyone in front of him. He turns around and sees. Cooler's attack has been launched right towards him. Boo's caught by surprise, but instinctively, he does something to try and counter it. He launches a candy beam at him. Wait, what? Can he do that? Can he actually turn this attack into candy? And it seems so. Cooler looks on in disbelief. His attack, somehow, he turned that key into candy. The candy hypernova flies over to Boo. It turns into a giant chocolate ball, and he eats it in one big bite. He laughs. That was their last attempt to try and defeat him. Kind of boring, but hey, he's glad that he at least got some nice candy out of it. He then turns back to Cooler. Cooler doesn't even know what to think. That was all of his power. They have no other hope now. They need to get out of here somehow. Maybe they can think of another plan. Boo begins launching towards him, but something weird happens. Boo's face begins turning weird. First he was smiling, but he looks confused now. He looks down at his stomach. There's a single beam of light coming out of it, and then another, and another. More beams of light come out of Boo, and he screams. He begins disintegrating, but then Cooler sees what happened. Even though he turned it into candy, the attack is still there with all of its power, and it exploded within him. He shrunk it down to such a small size that it actually made it more devastating. It's like he compressed it all into a singularity of sorts. It's delayed, but Boo is going to feel the full effect of the hypernova, and then some. This is going to be a problem. Cooler quickly launches a beam at Boo, trying to push him back. He tells everyone, get down here now. He looks back at the Kais too. Create a shield or something. They need to protect Earth. Now this attack is going to be out of control, especially because it's also dependent on what Boo does. He tells everyone to stand behind him. He'll try and take the brunt of the blast. Shin and Kabito begin creating barriers. This won't hold it back completely, but Cooler plans to use this as a barricade. They can use this to protect themselves and the planet, as well as probably pushing the attack back. It's a long shot, but maybe it'll work. Boo's not even a concern anymore. Cooler sees that he's clearly being erased and killed. He tells everyone, launch a beam now. They begin pushing the barricades created by Shin and Kabito. This gives extra power to the blasts as they're launched up towards the explosion. The entire planet is shaking. The power from this attack is devastating. Around where all these fighters are, things are being scorched completely by the attack alone. They're trying to push it back, but the attack's getting more and more powerful as it expands out. Boo is completely erased, and then, it seems like it's complete silence. But left in his absence, they see the hypernova there. It then explodes, giving off its full power. The group pushes one last time with their beams. They're basically acting as a shield for Earth right now. Cooler's losing energy. But he shouts, forcing more power out of himself. With one last push, 
they launch the hypernova out into space. The entire galaxy is illuminated by this attack, and it lingers for a few seconds, even a few minutes, and then it fully dissipates. They can't sense Boo anymore, too. They can't believe it. They did it. Even though it seemed hopeless at some point, they actually were able to accomplish this. They killed Boo. Cooler's on the ground, gasping for air, but otherwise, he's relatively okay. He looks up at everyone else, now back into his regular form and giving a weak thumbs up. Boo has been defeated, and Earth has been saved. So, where do we head now in the story? This is the end of the Z portion, so naturally, we're going to be going into Super next, and things are going to be changing a lot. There's a brief time skip here, and it's the pretty standard stuff. There's not too much change here, but as for Cooler, he is training to work on this Platinum form even more. He loved the power that came with it, but he needs to control it somehow. Maybe he could use it in the future. It seems volatile now, but if he gets a grasp on it, it can work. And actually, he is able to do something pretty interesting with it. He figures out that he can use it in his base form. So now he has two separate versions of Platinum. When he uses it in his base form, obviously there's a lot less power, but it's a lot easier to control, and there's not really that much stamina to drain at some point. He just refers to this as Platinum, but he doesn't plan on using this long term. Really what he's looking towards is his true Platinum form. This is when he goes Platinum in his final form, the form that he used against Boo. Of course, he still needs to work on controlling it, but once he actually gets that perfect control, his true Platinum form will be unlocked. And it's good timing too, because after this time skip, Beerus eventually does awaken, heading to Earth looking for the Super Saiyan God. Cooler is terrified to hear of this. Great, first Boo and now Beerus? They're not going to be able to defeat him. I mean, Boo was one thing, but Beerus? That's a god of destruction. That's a whole different level than Boo. Beerus makes Boo look like a bug in comparison. He is flipping out. He's met Beerus indirectly through Frieza, and of course he's heard about him through King Cold. Vegeta is also flipping out too. He knows the same exact thing. It's actually kind of funny, the two are acting the exact same here, and it's one of the few times that everyone sees Cooler and Vegeta concerned. They're going out of their way to please Beerus, and it's almost like the two of them are best friends right now. And even though Beerus does enjoy the festivities on Earth, he came here for a fight. He was looking for a Super Saiyan God, and they have no idea what that is. But hey, maybe they could still fight him. He can at least get a taste of their power and see if he likes it. And for the most part, the fights are pretty much nothing to him. He defeats everyone so easily that it's not even worth the effort really, except Cooler. Cooler eventually ends up fighting him, and Beerus is pretty amused. It's weird seeing the brother of Frieza here, also still alive while Frieza and King Cold are dead. He knows Frieza was a pretty tough guy, well, not in comparison to him. But in terms of his demeanor, and he still was strong, he was considered one of the strongest in the universe at one point. He wonders if Frieza's brother lives up to that same expectation, and Cooler tells Beerus, he can't be compared to Frieza, he's lived a completely different life. And in terms of strength, well, he might as well show Beerus for himself. First, he goes into his final form, and then he turns platinum, showing off his true platinum form. He doesn't have full control yet, but he's almost there. He's on the cusp of it. He tells Beerus, even though it might be a bit premature to call it his true platinum form, this is what it is, and this is full power right now. After all the time in the time skip, and with Cooler getting better control in this form, there's actually a huge change here. He's not just ahead of the Saiyans like he was before. There is a significant gap. Of course, it still isn't enough to defeat Beerus, but Beerus is actually impressed. He never would have expected to see this type of power from a mortal of all people, and he is pretty pleased with the fight. He sees potential within Cooler, but still he is curious. He wants to see a Super Saiyan God, and eventually, all that stuff with Shenron happens. They summon him, the ritual is done, and Goku becomes a Super Saiyan God and fights Beerus. But that's not actually the main focus here. Beerus is pleased that he found the Super Saiyan God, and this guy might be his rival. He's even stronger than what Cooler was at, and he has God Key after all. But he keeps Cooler in mind, and Cooler also keeps Beerus in mind. During their battle, Beerus did mention something. He's going to find a new god of destruction eventually. And it's like Beerus said before, he knows that Frieza had a pretty tough demeanor. He can see some of that within Cooler. Of course, morally they're completely different. But still, maybe Cooler could be the next god of destruction. Sure, the Saiyan is strong and all, but he definitely won't be up to it. And Cooler considers this too. God Key, a rival for Beerus, a new god of destruction. That could all be him. If he gets more control in his power, and combines God Key with it somehow too. Cooler could really move up in the universe, become the next God of Destruction. He would love that title. Of course, he wouldn't just go around destroying stuff randomly. He would actually try to be a good God of Destruction. I mean, it is a bit far off, but he considers this, and he keeps it in mind. That'll be his next goal. Although, there are going to be some issues ahead of him, and once again, it all stems from Cooler. Well, not entirely. This also stems from everyone else too, because the Frieza Force is planning on bringing their Emperor back. They would have loved to have Cooler lead them, but there's no other way. They need to revive Frieza. But they're terrified though. They don't know how to break the news to him that his brother has turned good and is now living with the Saiyans. He seems to be very friendly with them. Frieza is revived. Thankfully, Goku, Vegeta, and Cooler are all off planet, and his army sees an opportunity to get the Dragon Balls. They're successful. 
finally reviving their emperor once more, making Frieza's return official. Although, how are they supposed to explain this to him? Cooler is still out there, alive. They're gonna have to tell eventually, and the worst part is, they're gonna have to explain what Cooler's been up to. It's not like he's evil anymore. If he were still evil, Frieza wouldn't really care. He'd either just completely ignore Cooler, or just go out to kill him and finish the job. In his eyes, Cooler's not a threat. But he eventually does end up asking his army. What's happened with Cooler so far? Has he died? Did he go try and kill the Saiyans, maybe? Or is he still out there somewhere and he's gonna be a threat? Well, it's kinda weird. From what they gathered, he did eventually try and go attack the Saiyans. Oh, that's nice, he was trying to get revenge for Frieza. Not that he asked for it, but hey, whatever. Well, not exactly. It seemed he did it for another reason. Again, they're not too sure of the details. But from what they know, he ended up losing that fight. And Frieza's elated. Great, Cooler's dead, those monkeys killed him. Well, no, not exactly. Frieza's getting angry now. More explanations? Well, it's a little more complicated than that. Yes, he went to Earth to try and kill the Saiyans, and yes, he lost. But when he lost, he didn't end up dying. He was actually spared. This infuriates Frieza. That's what that monkey Goku tried to do on Namek. He tried to spare Frieza, tried to see if he turned good. Don't tell him. Cooler's actually done it. He was spared and he ended up turning good, didn't he? He doesn't want to hear it, but he knows that's what's about to be said. Sorbet tells him everything. Cooler has been living on Earth. Now, they don't know if he's exactly good or not, but he's been there for a while and he seems to fight alongside Goku, Vegeta, and the others a lot. So, from what they can infer, yes, he did take Goku's offer. He was spared and eventually did end up turning good. They don't know where he is now. He's been gone with the other Saiyans, too. Maybe they're all off somewhere together. And here's about what else has happened since he's been dead. There were some androids that attacked Earth. Majin Buu was revived, and Beerus awakened from his slumber. But Frieza doesn't even care about any of that. Yeah, Majin Buu is a big threat, but he's been dealt with. And as for Beerus, he doesn't need to be bothered with that. Cooler is his main concern. He doesn't even care about the Saiyans anymore. His brother, he never liked Cooler, but still, he joined the Saiyans of all people and turned good. He knew that his brother was soft. Of course, Cooler always thought he was stronger than Frieza, which actually ended up being true. And Frieza is infuriated. He does have an advantage over Cooler though. He's a mutant. Unlike his brother, he can grow insanely fast in terms of strength. If he starts training, which he abhors the idea of, he could become even stronger. Yes, that's what he'll do. He'll train. He'll use his mutant abilities. He'll wipe Cooler off the face of the universe. And then he'll go for those monkeys. Goku, Vegeta, and that one with the sword. Cooler couldn't have gotten that much stronger. If he's been with those people on Earth, there's no way he's grown. He's probably grown even softer than before. But Frieza's not going to take that chance. Maybe he is stronger. Maybe Cooler did get a lot more powerful than before. Frieza immediately goes into training. His sights are set on the Saiyans and Cooler. He has multiple targets, multiple sources of motivation, multiple people that he feels an immense hatred for. Frieza's not thinking clearly. He breaks stuff and even takes that out on his minions. He can't believe Cooler would do this. But he calms himself. As he gets stronger and stronger with his training, he realizes that this is going to work. He's going to teach Cooler a lesson. And he's not just going to kill Cooler and those Saiyans, no. He's going to make them suffer first. He's going to destroy everything and everyone that they've ever loved. And then, only then, will Frieza kill them. And after that, he will rule the universe once more, this time with a golden fist. He ends up unlocking his golden form. Of course, he doesn't know that Cooler has something similar, and he doesn't know that it's platinum either. He just does golden because that's what he feels like. But Frieza's prepared. He's gonna go to Earth, and he's much stronger than he was in the original series. He trained for a little bit longer and was training more intensely too. Yes, he did hate the idea of training, but with Cooler being the motivation here, as well as the Saiyans, he takes his training a lot more seriously than he did before. And it pays off. His golden form is immensely powerful. This might be overkill, actually. He doesn't know how strong the Saiyans and Cooler have gotten. But with this, there's no way they're going to win, no matter how strong they've gotten, no matter how many times they've changed their head, no matter what other forms Cooler's unlocked, because there's no way he unlocks something as good as this golden form. All the way on Beerus' planet, the three of them are training. Cooler's having a tough time tapping into God Key for himself. For Goku and Vegeta, yeah, they're just able to use it in Super Saiyan God, eventually even getting Super Saiyan Blue. But for Cooler, it's not like he can just incorporate it into a form. At least, not yet. He doesn't really know what he's supposed to do with it. He is getting a lot stronger training here, and Beerus is actually taking a liking to him. He does see Cooler as a potential candidate for God of Destruction later on. Right now is a bit too early and Cooler still isn't strong enough for it, but he could tell. In the future, Cooler might actually make a great candidate. He would be a good God of Destruction. Unlike Frieza, he doesn't seem like a loose cannon, but he does have the good properties of Frieza. He's a leader. He's able to make tough decisions when he needs to. And most importantly, he has a mindset of destruction. Even though it's been suppressed, Beerus can tell. One day, if Cooler is a god of destruction, or at least a candidate, he'd be a perfect fit for its job. But Cooler senses something really weird one day. He sensed power fluctuating before, and he didn't really know what it was because it was very faint and far away. But over the past few months, he sensed this power getting stronger and stronger, from a similar location. And now that it's getting stronger and stronger, he feels it a lot more clearly. One day, there's a really big burst in this power. It's not just Cooler that feels it either. The others on the planet do as well. Goku and Vegeta immediately recognize the key signature, and they look over to Cooler. 
He's standing there, looking over the horizon. It's almost like he's trying to look out into space where Frieza is. He senses it. That's definitely him. It's his brother. Slowly, he turns to Goku and Vegeta with a serious look on his face. No words need to be exchanged. They know exactly what's been happening. But as Kuro looks at them, his face then turns into a smile. And he even starts laughing. Like, not even in a sarcastic way. He's actually laughing like he finds this hilarious. What, is he not concerned about Frieza? Oh no, he feels like it might be a threat. But he just finds it hilarious that Frieza came back. And he can tell Frieza's probably plotting to kill them all. Maybe even destroy Earth in the process. They have no clue what he finds funny about that. But Cooler tells them. They'll defeat him. they faced worse odds before. Stronger opponents. The funny thing to Cooler is, he's probably pissed off at him. He's living rent-free in Frieza's mind right now. And he probably has been for the past few months. Hell, maybe even the whole time he was dead. It gives Cooler a good laugh. And he tells them they should laugh too. It's the same scenario for them. But his chuckles go away. He knows that they do have to deal with this sooner rather than later. So instead of waiting for Frieza to attack Earth, he says maybe they should head there right now. If he's powering up, it might be him testing out his full power, and he might arrive there soon. Beerus is a bit displeased since he still wants them to train here, but hey, this is fine. It might be some real world experience for them, and they could watch the battle too. It might be good for entertainment. And then they could just return to this planet right afterwards. So, Whis takes everyone to Earth. And this is actually a really good choice. They end up arriving before Frieza does. So instead of the Earthlings and Gohan and Piccolo being tasked to defend Earth, Goku, Vegeta, and Cooler are already there, prepared for whatever Frieza has planned. But this time, his wrath is much different. Instead of a coordinated attack, something really weird happens. Everyone's on high alert, ready for something to happen. In a nearby city, they hear that citizens are being attacked by aliens. That's the Frieza Force. Okay, well, that should be simple enough, and they can reverse the damage later on. But then, they hear that another city is being attacked. Then another, then another, then more. They see what Frieza's trying to do. He's planning total destruction of Earth, and this is some sort of mind game too. He's trying to lower everyone's morale, make them angry. This is not only intended to draw them out, but he knows that if he attacks defenseless Earthlings, that'll only infuriate everyone even more, and it'll make it harder to stop everything. They'll either have to ignore those citizens that are being killed by Frieza's soldiers, or they're gonna have to divide their attention amongst them. There's already a lot of damage and casualties, but the Dragon Team is strong. Everyone on there is incredibly fast, especially with Goku who has instant transmission. The group splits up, flying around Earth at rapid rates. There's one fighter task with every city. The Frieza Force soldiers are actually pretty weak in comparison. So weak that some of the human fighters can individually protect them. Even Goten and Trunk get involved, going into a city on their own and defeating the entire army there. As Cooler's defending one of the cities, he's wondering them, when and where is Frieza gonna show up? But he gets his answer not long after. He looks up into the sky and sees a giant ship. He sees a silhouette step off of it. There's a small glowing ball in his hands. He drops it down onto the city, and it expands out, completely flattening everything. Cooler tries his best to protect against it, trying to protect everyone here by throwing up some sort of shield. But he can only do so much. The damage is incredibly widespread. He looks around. Half of the city's vaporized by this attack. If Frieza's trying to get him mad, it's working. Cooler looks up at the sky as his brother descends downwards. Frieza's already in his final form. His eyes lock with Cooler's, and he smiles. Cooler should have expected this after all, that he would be the first target. He lands right in front of his brother, and the two stare each other down, with only a couple feet of space in between them. Cooler doesn't seem too surprised by his resurrection. Where's the welcoming party? I mean, his brother came back to life. He should be elated. He tells Cooler he expected some sort of surprise party. It's not very brotherly of Cooler to greet him like this. He chuckles a bit, and Cooler is not amused. Jokes aside, he knows that Cooler is smarter than that. He knows that he probably would have heard by now that Frieza's back, or at least sensed it. And Cooler's serious face goes away. He smirks too. He tells Frieza that he's elated he's back. And he begins questioning Frieza. Why does he want to kill Cooler? Why not recruit him? Why not try and convince him to join the Frieza Force? Frieza's eyes widen and he looks confused. What, what is he talking about? Cooler's been living here on Earth. He's good now. He's not going to join. But Cooler tells his brother. He could use a good ally, can't he? Instead of having a fight between each other, why not work together? They'd be the strongest duo in the universe. He walks closer to Frieza, putting a hand down. He's only been living here on Earth to find out the weakness of those Saiyans, growing stronger with them. He's been using them like a parasite. Training alongside them allowed him to grow so much stronger than before. He wouldn't mind killing them right now. With his current strength, he's done enough. He's even met Beerus. And he asks Frieza again. They should work together. Frieza didn't actually expect this. Cooler wants to work with him? I mean, this has to be a trick, doesn't have to be. But when he considers it, he doesn't really know much about Cooler or what's happened. Cooler stares down Frieza. And reluctantly, Frieza sticks out his hand, grabbing Cooler's. Cooler's smirk grows. Frieza really is as naive as he was before, isn't he? Frieza's thinking the exact same thing. As the two shake hands, their hands begin glowing. They place their other hand on each charging key, creating a massive explosion that knocks both of them back. Cooler's standing there chuckling. It's nice to play a practical joke on Frieza. Frieza said he knew this was some sort of trick, but he was trying to use it in his advantage. But Frieza says there's no time for banter. He's here for one thing and one thing only, slaughter. Cooler will be first, and then his monkey friends, as well as everyone else on Earth. And he's definitely not gonna make this quick, but he wants to escalate it quickly. So, Frieza begins transforming. 
surrounded by a golden aura, he then shows off his golden form. Cooler is actually quite surprised. When he sends Frieza's key, he did expect him to get some sort of new power, but it only makes him laugh even more. He just discovered a new form like this? And why'd he make it golden? Frieza's furious. What, like Cooler would have a better idea for a color? And Cooler says he has one suggestion. How about platinum? He's surrounded by a bluish-greenish key. Cooler's power explodes as he goes into his platinum form. Just as he expected, Frieza discovered a similar evolution in terms of power. Cooler's was done on a whim and he didn't really get to decide the color, but it's weird that Frieza went with golden. He just keeps mocking his brother, but Frieza says he'll shut him up pretty quickly. He launches towards his brother with a fist stab. Cooler catches the fist, having to use both hands to do so. His arms are shaking, as is Frieza's. Underneath his mask, Cooler smirks, while Frieza's face contorts more and more with anger. The two launch up into the sky, flashing high above the city. Around the earth, everyone else senses what's going on. They've cleared out most of the Frieza force, and sadly there was some damage to the cities, but they kept the damage and casualties to a minimum and they could restore it with the Dragon Balls. That's not really a big concern right now. The Frieza force is gone and now all they need to do is stop Frieza himself. Everyone's ready to head over, but they meet up with Goku and Vegeta first. They tell them to stay back. They don't know how big of a threat Frieza is. Goku and Vegeta say they'll head over there, but they might not even be needed. This seems like a fight between Cooler and Frieza. Piccolo questions them. Why aren't they going to help? Who cares about the personal relation between the two of them? But both Goku and Vegeta have the same mindset. They want to let Cooler do this on his own. This is something he wants to do. They've already agreed upon it, and it's not because of some game or whatever. It's just, Cooler feels like it's his duty. I mean, besides the fact that it's Frieza of all people, maybe Cooler sees it as repentance, a way to make up for his past deeds and evilness. Or maybe he just wants to settle his personal grudge with Frieza, prove that he's the stronger brother, show off his strength and growth, and show what Earth can really do to someone. At least, that's how Goku views it. In terms of Vegeta, well, he's not gonna interrupt another guy's fight. As much as he would love to kill Frieza himself, Cooler's earned the right more than anyone. But they're gonna head over there just in case. They fly over to the city, and nearby there's Beerus and Whis, both of whom have giant tubs of popcorn. No way they're seriously treating this like a movie. But Goku and Vegeta watch on. Frieza and Cooler continue to clash. It seems that they're dead even. Frieza didn't expect this. His brother grew this strong without the mutant abilities that he has. And Cooler tells Frieza, yeah, he might be a mutant and all. He always knew his brother was a prodigy, someone with insane potential and quick growth. But he rushed that power. There's no sense of accomplishment with that. As for Cooler, look at what Earth did to him. He tells Frieza. He feared the Saiyans at first, thinking that a Super Saiyan would come and kill him next. But he tells Frieza it's the opposite. They saved him. This angers Frieza more and more. He grabs on the Cooler's tail and launches towards the ground, slamming his brother down into the dirt, creating a massive crater. He then jumps up. He places both hands down, launching a volley of key blasts at his brother. The explosions rapidly hit the ground below, throwing up more and more dirt, hitting Cooler with a constant barrage of this power. Goku, Vegeta, Beerus, and Whis watch on. Is Frieza getting the upper hand? But from below in that crater, Cooler slowly stands up. At first, it's hard to deflect the blast, but he gets more and more sturdy, looking right up at Frieza. Amidst all the chaos, he puts his hands together, launching a giant blast upwards. He plants his feet firmly into the ground, launching up into the air right at Frieza again, hitting him square in the face with a punch so powerful that it parts all the clouds below them. He tells Frieza once again, look at the strength that he harnessed. Without those Saiyans, he wouldn't be here. Not only has he gotten stronger, but he's found a purpose in life. He knows that Frieza's never going to change though, sure. He could have all the power in the universe, all that amazing potential, all that influence, but that doesn't matter. At the end of the day, Cooler knows he has something that Frieza will never have, not in a million lifetimes, no matter how many times he's revived or whatever. Cooler has fulfillment in his life. He has that great strength too, and he has that influence, but he's actually doing something good in the universe. And he's happy. He's proud of himself. He continues pummeling Frieza with powerful attacks. How is this happening? Cooler's getting ahead of him, they were just even before. But with this golden form comes great stamina drain. And not only that, but Cooler's determination is driving him so much further. He's getting stronger as he fights. His confidence, his anger, his resilience. All of it is helping him refine his power here. And as for Frieza, he's only getting weaker as the fight goes on. Frieza's so angry that he visibly begins shaking. He tells Cooler he cares about none of that. He reminds Cooler he's here to slaughter him and everyone he loves. He wanted to torture Cooler, but whatever. He'll make this quick. He puts both hands up into the air. He charges a massive amount of key together. It's the biggest death ball he's ever produced. He channels all of his remaining power into it, launching it right at Cooler. Cooler will be eviscerated alongside the rest of the Earth. The ball of energy gets closer and closer. Cooler simply stares at it, not moving at all. Under his breath, he begins saying something, and Frieza can't hear it. Beerus, Whis, Goku, and Vegeta watch on. Goku and Vegeta start flying over. It's about to hit Earth. What's Cooler doing? He's just standing there. But Cooler then looks directly up, his eyes wide, and he finishes saying what he said under his breath. He yells, ha, launching a Kamehameha forward. The death ball is launched right back at Frieza. He tries to push it back, but it's no use. The attack explodes in the air, injuring Frieza greatly, and he's then hit by Cooler's Kamehameha. Frieza is completely eviscerated by this attack. Goku and Vegeta stop midair, watching what happens. Cooler lets out a deep breath of relief, then powering down into his base. He turns over to both of them, who are already in Super Saiyan Blue. He smirks and gives a thumbs up. 
Vegeta just looks unsurprised, while Goku smiles. This part starts off in Trunks' timeline. Something unexpected, but still partially expected happens. Cooler shows up here. Trunks is really taken aback by this. I mean, he's not concerned. He's just more so surprised that Cooler showed up after all this time. He thought he just didn't exist in this timeline. But obviously this Cooler isn't the same one as in the past. Trunks wonders. Maybe there's a chance at him getting redemption too. A chance at him turning good. But it doesn't seem like that. This Cooler has lived a much longer life and a much more evil one. He never had the intentions of coming to Earth for good purposes. He just wanted to come to kill the Saiyans and it seems like somebody already did that job. Although, there is one Saiyan left. And that is Trunks. Trunks tries to discuss with him, telling him about the other Cooler in the other timeline. But Cooler doesn't care. He's not going to turn good or anything. Or at least that's what he flat out says. Given the situation that he's in, and the different things that Cooler went through in this timeline, not to mention how long it took for Cooler to actually reform in the past timeline, Trunks realizes that this might not be possible. He would like to spare Cooler, and have him turn into an ally here. And he even does try that, sparing Cooler, but this only humiliates him. Cooler gets angrier and angrier. He can tell that Trunks is holding back while fighting him. He's able to take Cooler on just in his base form alone. And then once he goes into Super Saiyan, it's no contest. Future Cooler just gets more and more angry, more bitter. He sees this as an insult that he's being spared. He continues trying to fight to the death, and at one point, he threatens to blow up Earth. Trunks has no other choice now. This Cooler has no shot at turning good. Well, at least he tried. He ends up having to kill Cooler, defeating the tyrant with a powerful Masenko sending him off into space. Besides this brief encounter, a lot of Trunks' timeline goes the same. The future Buu saga goes pretty much like it did normally. And eventually, a new threat shows up. Someone who is familiar, but not the same. Let's go back to the present timeline. The Universe X tournament happens. No, I'm not covering it here. I mean, you can guess the result. They have Cooler on the team, plus a stronger Goku and Vegeta, so I think it's pretty obvious what happens here, so... Yeah, there's no real need to cover it because you could already tell that they win and it's a pretty easy win. But obviously it's worth noting that it did happen, because it obviously ties into the next arc and the one after that. Trunks then returns to the past. He's in a panic. Someone's attacking his timeline. It's Goku Black. And just to preface this, yes, this arc is going to start pretty normally. And actually, we can kind of breeze through the beginning of it. But don't worry, just because this arc is starting out the same doesn't mean it's going to go the same. Not at all. There's a reason I mentioned what I did in the beginning. Goku Black follows Trunks to the past, showing up there and then getting defeated, going back to his timeline. Thankfully, Trunks isn't going to return for some time, because Goku Black destroyed the time machine. Although, he senses something else. Something really strange. It doesn't feel real. Like, it's artificial. Some sort of weird power. He meets up with Zamasu to get healed. And he senses this too. That's strange. They eliminated most of the mortals here, and they would have known if there was something powerful out in space, but something strong is coming towards them. Or at least they feel like it's strong, they can't really tell too well. They then see an incredibly bright flash in the sky. Some object rockets down towards Earth. Is that some sort of meteorite? No, it's different. That's the thing that they were sensing. It lands on Earth, not crashing into it, but actually landing. So now they're confused. They go over to check it out. It's a giant chunk of metal, some sort of object. Goku Black is about to go check it out. But Zamasu tells him to wait for a bit. They see a figure step out from it. And as it comes into the light, they get a clear look at what it is. It looks like a man made of metal, some sort of robot or something. And that person looks just as confused as those two. It's cooler. Of course, they don't know who that is, and he doesn't know who they are either. But seeing these two people is strange. One of them looks like a Saiyan, and one of them, he can't really tell. Is that like a Supreme Kai or something? What the hell are they doing here, and what happened to this planet? It's all scorched. And most importantly, he wants to find where Trunks is. He asks them what happened with Trunks. They definitely had something to do with this, didn't they? And the two of them start laughing. He wants to kill Trunks? Well, the two of them bluff. They say they did it. Trunks is already dead, and they did the honors. And now they want to know who he is, because they basically control this planet now. Cooler looks angry for a bit, but then smiles. At first, he was angered that he heard they killed Trunks. He wanted to do that himself. But on the other hand, this is good. If they were strong enough to kill Trunks, they'll make a perfectly great challenge for him. They don't know what he's talking about. But he introduces himself. This is Metal Cooler. He's merged with the Big Getty Star. And over the past few years, he's amassed such a great amount of power. Of course, one of his goals was to come back and kill Trunks, taking his power and absorbing Earth as well. But this, this should be fine. The Big Getty Star will go stronger, and whoever the Saiyan is, he'll still give Cooler some fun. Maybe even that Supreme Kai. Goku Black and Zamasu lunge towards him. This is a mechanical object. There's no way he could hope to challenge them. But they're underestimating him. This is Cooler after being merged with the Big Getty Star for years on end. Not only did he amass a great amount of power, but the Star did as well, getting a bunch of great data along the way. The two start fighting him. He launches a powerful attack that erases half of Zamasu, but of course he regenerates from this. Cooler looks a bit shocked at first, and then his arm is sliced off by Goku Black. Oh, so they could regenerate too. Cooler then regenerates his arm. This is going to be more interesting than he thought. As they continue fighting him, another Cooler shows up. And then another, and another. An army of metal coolers is being created, and they have one target. Not Zamasu, no. By now they can tell he's weaker. They'll deal with him later and he seems to be immortal or something. But this other guy, this one that looks like a Saiyan, 
he's taking damage, and he's not regenerating at all. Of course, the damage is minimal right now, but as more coolers show up, they focus just on him. Goku Black desperately tries to fight them, but nothing's working, and eventually, a massive wire shoots out from the ground below, grabbing Goku Black, pulling him into the core. Zamasu tries to cut him free, but more wires come out, holding Zamasu hostage. They're gonna keep him on the outside while they take Goku Black on the inside, and Zamasu watches on, trying to figure out what's happening. Wait, what is he doing? He uses the Kai Kai to teleport out of the wires, and he ends up in the core of the Big Getty Star. He sees Goku Black in there, struggling to get free. He's about to go help him, but Goku Black says no, let him do this himself. It'll make him angry, and it'll give him more power. And at the same time, they both sense something else, as well as Cooler sensing it too, Trunks. Zamasu teleports away, while Goku Black remains in the core of the Big Getty Star. Zamasu teleports right to them, and they're confused. Where's Goku Black, and who's this guy? Wait a second, that's Vegeta, and Goku, they're here too. And then there's another guy. What the hell, this is... This is that metal guy that he was just fighting, but he's not metallic, he looks normal. Everyone is just as confused, but then they sense something nearby. It seems like Goku Black powers up, but his power then subsides, with another huge power taking over it, and this power feels familiar but also different, although Cooler recognizes it all too well. Is that... is that his own key? No, it can't be, I mean, it feels familiar, but it's mutated so much that... that can't be him, and why would he even be here in the future, what's happening? Trunks already told them he killed Cooler in the future, which Cooler did take kind of offense to, but he didn't really care too much. He knew that his future self would be a threat, but he's supposed to be dead, so why is he sensing that power? And also what happened with Goku Black. They're about to fight Zamasu, but he doesn't know what to do either. They hear an explosion. Zamasu turns around and everyone looks behind him. Something bursts out of the ground. It's Metal Cooler once again, or at least one of them. He begins laughing maniacally. That power will definitely make a great addition to him. Zamasu's confused, what does he mean? He should have helped out his friend when he had the chance. He powered up while he was in the Big Getty Star. But Cooler was able to subdue him, taking that power for himself, as well as all the data alongside Goku Black. He hates to break it to Zamasu, but he turned his pal into a battery. Goku Black is stuck inside the Big Getty Star, now powering it, with the Big Getty Star draining all his energy, killing him. He killed Goku Black? That easily? But as Metal Cooler's laughing, he then sees something that catches his eye. Trunks. Wait, next to him there's two other Saiyans, and one of them looks like that one that he just absorbed. But then the most shocking thing of all, he sees himself. Cooler slowly walks up to Metal Cooler. Both of them say nothing, having the same confused and neutral face. Metal Cooler smirks. Oh, he knows what this is. This is that Cooler from the past that Trunks told him about, the one that ended up turning good. He sees what happened now. Trunks escaped to the past and brought some friends alongside him. This is that insect that he heard about. But Cooler laughs at this. He's calling him weak? It seems like he's imitating him, if anything. Metal Cooler's confused. Imitating him? What does that mean? Well, it's just that form. It looks so familiar to his own form, but it looks like it's purely mechanical and not actually real. That's so foolish. Form? Metal Cooler's confused even more. What transformation is he talking about? This isn't a transformation, this is him merging with the Big Getty Star. How pathetic. He had to let some piece of technology take over him to get this strong. And he's stealing the power of others, too. Cooler shows off what he means, turning into his platinum form. Unlike that unsightly thing that he's using, this is purely natural. Who cares if that cooler's made of metal? This one is platinum. And it's strange, he only just recently killed Frieza. And now, he's gonna have to kill himself. And he lets Metal Cooler know one thing. Once he dies, he wants him to say hi to Frieza in hell, at least in this timeline's hell. And let him know that his brother killed his past self, too. This angers Metal Cooler to no end. He's being mocked, compared to Frieza, too. And immediately, the two coolers start fighting. Goku, Vegeta, Trunks, and Zamasu are all confused. But they need to join in on the fight as well. Although, Zamasu's there. They should stop him, too. So, they all attack him, and immediately it becomes apparent that they won't be able to defeat him. Of course, the three of them fighting him is overkill, but he's immortal. They can't kill him or anything. And Zamasu actually seems kind of worried. They just met him, and they heard about his plan. But Trunks tells Goku and Vegeta, go help Cooler. He wants to talk to Zamasu alone. Zamasu could finally get a word in. He says they need to stop this. As much as he hates the idea of working alongside them, they have a common enemy now. Face it, they're not going to be able to kill Zamasu. He's just as pissed as this thing as they are. He just killed Goku Black. But Trunks says if anything, that would make him an ally. No, this force, this thing that they're fighting, he's destructive. He came here specifically to kill Trunks too. Trunks obviously knew that. He just wants to make sure that this guy actually isn't allied with Goku Black or Zamasu. He's just surprised that Cooler returned at all, especially at this time. The two make a strange but temporary agreement. For the time being, Zamasu's gonna help them. He wants to kill this guy as well. They can settle their differences later on, and Zamasu's power could be helpful. Of course, immediately after this, he's gonna turn on them, and they're gonna do the same. But he realized that this threat is bigger than all of them combined. The only way they'll stop it is with his help. What is Zamasu gonna do to help, though? Did Trunks forget? He's a Supreme Kai. He could heal people. Not to mention, he is immortal. He'll be the perfect shield, and the perfect medic. Would he really do that? Would he really help heal the people he's trying to kill? Well, yeah. He chuckles a bit. 
He could just kill them later on too, but he could tell. If they don't defeat this guy right now, something much worse will happen and it'll affect him too. Reluctantly, the two join forces, heading towards the battle. Cooler is getting pushed back more and more. Thankfully, Goku and Vegeta have joined him, but Metal Cooler is actually really powerful. And as he continues taking power from Goku Black's body, something suddenly overcomes him. A new sense of power. Goku, Vegeta, Cooler, and Zamasu react immediately. His key, it changes completely. It's, it's godly. Metal Cooler looks down at his hands. This is interesting. He powers up, summoning more of this energy. Within the core of the Big Getty Star, Goku Black's hair begins flashing. Of course, he's just a shell of his former self right now, but he is still acting as a battery. His hair. It turns pink, and Metal Cooler within the core sees this too. The Metal Coolers on the outside all start glowing. A pinkish aura surrounds them. With Goku Black inside of him, Metal Cooler has called upon the power of Super Saiyan Rose. Goku Black's evolution allowed him to evolve, and now it seems like he's going to be unstoppable. Well, almost unstoppable. There is one more thing he wants. Zamasu. Yeah, Zamasu might be a weakling, but he's immortal, and that could be really helpful. Of course, the Big Getty Star thinks it's immortal, although it can only do so much. Imagine absorbing Zamasu within it, making it truly immortal. The Metal Cooler start suddenly focusing their effort on him. Thankfully, Zamasu is able to teleport away quickly, kai kai around the planet to try and avoid this. The other Metal Coolers fight the Saiyans, as well as the normal Cooler. Metal Cooler taunts them. Where did that confidence go? He thought Cooler was going to kill them, send him to Frieza. And this is bad. This is really bad. Metal Cooler's gotten so much stronger. Even Cooler doesn't know if this will work, but maybe they're going about it all wrong. Maybe they shouldn't be fighting these soldiers. Maybe they're just puppets. They need to go right towards the source, the core of the Big Getty Star. I mean, they're gonna have to go out here eventually. They can't just leave it here on Earth. So they might as well try now. Maybe that's their best shot at defeating it. So the four of them all depart, rushing through an army of metal coolers, then arriving to the core itself, punching a hole in the wall and jumping inside. More metal coolers begin to chase them. And as soon as they get inside, they're grabbed by a bunch of wires. Nearby, they see Goku Black, clearly dead. But it's almost like he's a zombie. There's power still coming out of him, and his hair has even changed color. It looks like some Super Saiyan form. That must be where Metal Cooler got that power up. The four of them are able to break free from the wires, not being contained forever. And it's easy because they're not the main focus. Another person comes into the core. It's Zamasu. He's unconscious, and he's the main source now. Or at least, it seems he's unconscious. And Metal Cooler is glad that he has an audience now. He tells them to watch. He begins taking power from Zamasu. And the energy, it's technically infinite. Since Zamasu is immortal, he won't die here. Whenever the Big Getty Star completely drains him of his energy, he'll just regenerate, getting more and more energy to give to the Big Getty Star. The core of the Big Getty Star does this once, completely draining Zamasu of his energy, seemingly killing him. But then, he rejuvenates. And he's conscious now. He sees what's happening. It's already too late. They have nothing to do now. And this will be his fate. For the rest of eternity, he's going to be stuck as a battery for the Big Getty Star, completely getting drained and then replenished all over again. This is torturous. The core of the Big Getty Star turns over to them, looking directly at Cooler. Now does he see what he's talking about? He's the ultimate life form. The Big Getty Star made him mechanical, and he bluffed before that he was immortal, but this, this is true immortality. But Zamasu notices something. Every time he's drained, the Big Getty Star only takes in so much at once, and then seems to stop for a bit. It's, it's regulating itself. He would try and kai-kai away, but his energy is getting drained whenever he tries to. He gets drained once more and has an idea. As soon as he rejuvenates, he unleashes a ton of energy at once. And when the Big Getty Star takes this in, it seems to be injured. The others see what's happening. Zamasu does this again, and again. He's overloading it. They start to do the same. Thankfully, the stars aren't taking energy from them. But if they can attack at the second that Zamasu does this, they might be able to overload it. The Big Getty Star sees what's happening. No, not like this. But it's already too late. Zamasu does it once more, and everyone all attacks the core at once. And this does the job. It completely overloads the core. And then, it begins draining energy from Zamasu at a rapid pace. More than Zamasu can even keep up with. Zamasu continues trying to summon more power. And the star, it goes haywire. It starts continuously taking energy. Zamasu begins dematerializing. It's like, it's like he's becoming a part of the star now. But at the same time, it's getting overloaded. The Saiyans and Cooler all jump outside as soon as possible. And watch as the star begins getting overloaded. It's surrounded by electricity, and then everything goes quiet. Followed by a massive explosion. The star begins crumbling from the outside and from the inside. Using Zamasu as an infinite battery was a terrible idea. It was too much energy for it to handle. And they look on. Oh god, what is this? Are they going to see Metal Zamasu now? Or maybe a new version of Metal Cooler with infinite energy? They're ready for anything, but... It seems like it's over. There's nothing left behind. They can't send Zamasu or Goku Black. And there's no Metal Cooler. Parts of the Big Getty Star rain from the sky. It merged with Zamasu, and that ended up overloading it to a point where it couldn't contain itself. The mechanical nature of the star was incompatible with that of Zamasu. Zamasu and Goku Black became one of the Big Getty Star, basically causing Zamasu to die alongside with it. As parts of the star rain from the sky, one interesting piece falls down. It's a computer chip of sorts. Cooler catches it. Strange. They'll bring this back to the past in case it causes any trouble. Vegeta says they should destroy it now, but Cooler says maybe there's something else they could do with it. What if they could bring this to Bulma? 
harness the power of it somehow, and all the data from it. It's risky, but it might work. Surprisingly, Earth is still intact. Of course, there's a massive crater where the Big Getty Star once was, but people are still alive, and Trunks is still here, and his timeline's not erased, so hey, things are already better than they turned out in the main story. Goku Black, Zamasu, and Metal Cooler are gone, so he thanks everyone as they return to the past. So we're gonna be doing something a bit different with this one. Of course, we are still going into the Tournament of Power, but I'm gonna kinda breeze through it. Not entirely like I do with the Universe 6 Tournament, but I've covered the Tournament of Power so much in my other videos that I feel like it gets monotonous after some time. There's not too much I could change up about it, and I'm more so focused on the stuff that happens afterwards because that's actually very different and very important. So, let's start covering it. Thankfully, the Tornado Power Team is pretty easy to create. It's pretty much the same as it was in canon, except instead of Frieza, you obviously have a cooler on there. Everyone else is the exact same, not in terms of their strength, but in terms of the same people. And with Cooler being on the team, it's not like they have to recruit someone that they don't trust. Frieza was too much of a wild card. Cooler is actually an ally, someone they know they could trust and depend on while also being very strong and probably the strongest on the team right now. Although, Goku and Vegeta are still trying to get ahead. They feel like they have something in mind, something that they could utilize. But the two are going down very different paths. As for Goku, he's utilizing Whis's training a lot, while as for Vegeta, he's actually focused on kind of emulating Beerus, as is Cooler. Although, Cooler's been trying to evolve himself more lately in different ways. Remember how in the last part they retrieved the computer for the Big Getty Star? Well, Cooler actually did make use of it. Not completely yet, but he gave it to Bulma, and she's gonna begin working on it, seeing if she can make it useful for Cooler somehow. He saw how powerful Metal Cooler was, and of course, he's not gonna use the computer in the same way. Instead of the Big Getty Star taking control of him and using his power, it's gonna be the other way around. He wants to take control of that and use its power, while also being way less destructive than that is. Although, he still has the God of Destruction role in his mind. He wants to become one one day, and Vegeta surprisingly is taking up the same route. Of course, he doesn't want to become an actual god of destruction, but learning the powers, that could be fun, and the two are kind of competing with each other in the sense. As for Goku, he's not too interested in that, hence the Whis training. This is gonna have some big effects on the tournament, specifically with Vegeta. So, as I mentioned, we're gonna kind of breeze through it. It's pretty obvious with the team stacked like this, Universe 7 is gonna win, and two big breakthroughs happen here. For one, Goku does unlock Ultra Instinct while fighting Jiren. And as for Vegeta, he unlocks something pretty interesting while fighting Topo. No blue evolution here, no. He goes right from blue into Ultra Ego, something very similar to what Topo has, but also his own thing. This is one fight I'll actually cover because it's pretty interesting. Topo and Vegeta are pretty similar in that sense. They're both training under a God of Destruction, utilizing those powers. Although he notices that Vegeta doesn't actually want to become a God of Destruction. He's utilizing those powers for himself in a different way. Topo's not sure if he respects that. He's throwing away his morals completely to use his God of Destruction mode while Vegeta's making it his own thing. Maybe he could learn a thing or two from Vegeta. Even though he's a candidate for God of Destruction, maybe he could find a way around this and not completely abandon his former self in order to become one. The two have a duel each using these powers. As for Vegeta, he noticed that Topo operates differently. Although, the two are obviously using similar energies and forms. It's pretty much a contest of two equals, and the two have a great experience from it. Although, Vegeta does end up winning in the end, being the stronger one. But besides that, there's not too much of note that happens in the tournament. Universe 7 is incredibly overpowered. Again, it's the same team, except they have stronger people. And the fact that Vegeta has Ultra Ego makes it pretty obvious too that they're gonna win here, even if Cooler wasn't on the team. You have Goku with Ultra Instinct, Vegeta with Ultra Ego, Cooler with his Platinum Form and God of Destruction powers, Piccolo who's stronger than before, Gohan who has a different kind of strength here. There's so many different variables that affect this. So why did I rush through that? I never really do that, but there's a good reason to because there's a lot more that happens in this part that I feel is very important and you guys really want to hear. So I'd rather save the time for that. Anyways, let's stop wasting time by explaining and actually go to it. So following the tournament itself, Bolo eventually does finish the project, working on the Big Getty Star's chip and trying to fix it, trying to make it so that it's not going to take over Cooler. She gives it to him and installs it, and he feels no different, but he does notice. He gets all the data that it collected. She was able to preserve that, which is great. It collected so much data while in the future, from Goku Black, from Trunks, from Cooler. Zamasu, everywhere in that timeline, there's so much that it collected. Even Goku, Vegeta, and Cooler himself, not just future Cooler. He could utilize this data for himself, growing a lot stronger and smarter, as well as being able to analyze enemies more effectively now, because he has a computer helping him. It's essentially a cybernetic upgrade for him. You could think of it like having a scouter installed right within him, except it's way more sophisticated than a regular scouter, with all the data of an incredibly powerful supercomputer. Of course, with him in control of the Big Getty Star now, or at least its core, he does have other abilities too. He could actually try and form a new Big Getty Star, not one by destroying other planets, no. Maybe he can go around and just find random asteroids in space or something. Doing that won't have any moral issues. 
Of course, it's cooler. I mean, he is a good guy, but he's not gonna care if he goes to some random planet and absorbs it for himself to get stronger. That's not really that big of a deal for him. Sure, there's ethical issues for anyone else, but for Cooler, nah, that's fine. And it would be pretty cool to try out. He's gonna go on a test run first. So, he decides he's gonna go very far away from Earth, flying out into space, going into a completely different part of the galaxy. Yes, he's actually gonna go out into space and absorb a planet, which no one actually expected him to do right away, but hey, it's Cooler, he's pretty rash, and this is something he would definitely want to do in this scenario. It sounds really fun for him, too. And unlike the future Cooler that was using this power, he's not gonna be absorbing a planet with life on it. No, he's just gonna find a random rock out in space and use those materials to make more metal coolers, or buff himself somehow. He doesn't know how this is gonna work, but he's gonna find out, and he has no qualms about it. He ends up finding some really weird planet. It's definitely desolate. He doesn't sense any powers on it at first, but before he actually absorbs it, he is gonna check it out just in case. It seems completely uninhabitable, which is why he's thinking that no one lives on here. He descends on it, and he sees a yellow wasteland. It's just miles and miles of nothing, and it's a harsh environment. Well, at first, he continues walking around, and suddenly, he picks up on something. Some power, some really strong power. It's flying right towards him. He then sees a man descends with someone else on his back holding onto him. Is that a Saiyan? Wait, 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 a Saiyan all the way out here? What the hell is this? And they're just as confused too. This is obviously Broly in Paris. They saw Cooler land over here, seeing him enter the atmosphere and all. And up close, they can immediately tell he's a threat. Although, they could use him to get off this planet, but still, it's Cooler of all people. They know he's way worse than Frieza, or at least they assume he still is. And it's a pretty bad look for Cooler because they catch him right in the middle of him absorbing the planet, or at least part of it at first. They immediately mark him as a threat. Of course, they'd like to get off of here, but it seems like Cooler's not going to help them out. A pretty bad judgment on their part. Paragus sticks Broly on Cooler. Wait, he doesn't want to fight. He tries to calm Broly down, but Broly's not hearing it. They're not going to trust Cooler of all people. Frieza, maybe they could, but Cooler has a reputation. A very bad one. He's a lone wolf for a reason. Even the Frieza Force didn't work with him. But something weird happens to Cooler mid fight, and this will actually really help him out. He doesn't want to kill Broly. He wants to restrain him, definitely. So he doesn't want to power up too much, but as he absorbs more of the planet, he actually notices something interesting. He's already getting control over the Big Getty Star, and he's able to create a few metal coolers too. He only goes into his final form, not his platinum form, because he doesn't want to use too much power and scare them. Clones of him end up being created, as well as him being able to control wires from the planet. Oh, this is neat. This is what that other cooler was doing. Of course, he's not going to trap them or whatever and try to use them as batteries. He just wants to make sure they're restrained, just to stop the fight so there's no killing here. He's able to restrain Broly pretty quickly, as well as Paragus, and he begins explaining to them. He was absorbing the planet because he thought no one was on here, which is why he was searching around at first. He only stopped because he saw them, and he's not going to do it anymore if they're going to stay here. But it's definitely not a good look. Cooler being here is one thing, but him absorbing the planet, especially him describing it that way, yeah, they're definitely not going to trust him. As Broly is restrained, he only gets more and more enraged, losing control of himself. Paragus is able to move his hand, reaching for the remote in his pocket and pressing it, trying to restrain Broly even more. This could get really bad if Broly goes out of control, and this causes some pretty big issues with Cooler himself. Broly does get shocked like he planned, but something happens with Metal Cooler himself, or at least the Metal Cooler clones. Through the wires, that current is sent through there too, short-circuiting all of the Cooler clones. And it was pretty stupid on Paragus's part because as the electricity goes through, it ends up hitting him too, completely shocking him, even more than Broly. Oh god, what did Cooler just do? He looks on and he sees. Paragus just falls to the ground. Oh, um, did Cooler just help kill him on accident? Cooler didn't want this to happen, but why was he doing that to his own son in the first place? Were they trying to escape somehow by doing that? But no, that didn't, wouldn't make sense. He saw Broly has the shock collar around him. Why was Paragus shocking his own son? Cooler's trying to figure out what to do now because he didn't want Paragus to die, but that was kind of his own fault. It was a pretty stupid thing to do and he must have not noticed that he was being controlled by wires and not actually just any other organic parts. And instead of calming Broly's rage, this only makes things worse. Seeing Paragus dead, he goes Super Saiyan. And of course, there's only one person to target, Cooler himself. Uh-oh, this got even worse. And this guy is a Super Saiyan, so maybe it's not that bad. He's seen higher Super Saiyan forms, but no, Broly is actually really strong, even just as a regular Super Saiyan. Crap, maybe this wasn't a great idea, but Cooler doesn't want to kill Broly. Even though Broly's trying to kill him, he can tell he's not doing it in his own control. And he does feel a bit bad for Broly too. Seeing how his father was treating him and the fact that they're on this planet for so long, there's definitely something up with Paragus that he doesn't know about. And he wants to figure it out. But first he needs to stop Broly. He could try and fight him more, but he's gonna have to use more of his power. So he ends up pulling out Platinum. And he begins absorbing more of the planet too, in order to create some clones in order to restrain Broly. And this actually does help a bit. 
having all these clones with him, and using his platinum form, it actually is able to counter Broly's power, even though it's very great. And he's using it against Broly, using the entire planet of Vampa against him. And he's not fighting to kill here, so he can't just use all of his power. He's just trying to restrain Broly, even though Broly keeps escaping. But something interesting happens. As he absorbs more of the planet, more creatures come out of it, which he didn't even expect. And something really weird happens with Broly. His eyes, they go from being completely white to going back to normal. And he even detransforms. What? He sees some weird creature, some green snake thing. It's a giant creature too. And it seems pretty scared and it's missing an ear. And then Cooler realizes what's happening. That pelt around Broly's waist, it looks like the exact same color as that creature over there. Is it related somehow? Yeah, he ended up finding Ba an accident, Broly's former friend and pet. And this actually helps Broly calm down and recollect himself. What a weird turn of events, but hey, Cooler's not gonna complain about it. Okay, so he needs to figure out what's been happening here. He's very sorry about Paragus, but Paragus kinda did it to himself, so not really. But he begins explaining to Broly why he's here and how he actually didn't want to do this. He was trying to make sure that no one was on this planet. He just couldn't sense anyone and it didn't seem like there was any sort of intelligent life here. Just random hostile creatures and giant parasitic bugs or whatever. Broly begins explaining their backstory. They were sent here a while ago. And Cooler feels like he knows what this is about. This has something to do with Frieza. No, maybe King Vegeta. Maybe King Vegeta was at fault. That actually sounds like it. Broly knows about Vegeta because Paragus has trained him to hate Vegeta. Not just King Vegeta and the rest of the Saiyans, but specifically Prince Vegeta, the one on Earth right now. Cooler begins explaining, telling him he's got it all wrong. Vegeta's not a bad guy, he's actually a great guy now too. He's reformed, as has Cooler, which is strange because Broly didn't expect this. He's heard about Frieza and Cooler, and he knows Cooler has a bad reputation, which is exactly why they attacked right away. But Cooler begins telling Broly, he has no reason to trust Cooler, but Cooler could take him back to Earth and help him out. He can give him a new home. Vampa is 100% not a great place, and of course he is sad about his father, but Cooler could see that Paragus wasn't really a great parent, so it's probably best not to bring that up right now, but it's worth noting. But Broly asked, if they take him to that planet, take Bob with them too. How is that supposed to work? Cooler has an idea. He flies into space, and then comes back a few minutes later. Broly thought he abandoned him, but Cooler comes back with more metal coolers. Those metal coolers then merge, forming into a giant spaceship of sorts. This will let them bring him back allowing Broly and Ba to be transported through space. And they might not be able to keep him on Earth, but hey, maybe they're gonna take him to Mars or the moon or something. Terraform a little piece of it, use it for training, and have Ba stay there. Make it a nice habitable environment for him, not like here. Oh yeah, and before he leaves, he absorbs the rest of planet Vampa. It's already too far gone anyways, and he might as well finish what he started. Although he knows now, going forward, this probably isn't the greatest idea to keep doing. But hey, he at least got what he wanted and to get stronger from it. Broly is taken back to Earth and everyone's pretty glad to meet him. This story Cooler tells him is very weird, but it seems definitely like something Cooler would get up to. So next, of course, we'd have Granola. He would hear that Frieza is killed by Cooler by this point, but still, that doesn't mean he has to trust Cooler or anything. He's glad that Frieza's dead, but apparently there's some Saiyans alive, and of course, Cooler is Frieza's brother, so it's not like Cooler is his savior or anything. He's still gonna wanna go on this plot for revenge, although it's not really gonna go as planned. He does make his wish, but by the time all this starts, He's going to be fighting Ultra Instinct Goku, Ultra Ego Vegeta, and Cooler. Having Cooler there actually does make a difference. Goku and Vegeta both have more experience with Ultra Instinct and Ultra Ego here respectively, as well as being stronger from the get-go. And of course, that didn't really help too much in the main story at first. But with them being stronger and Cooler being here, specifically him being Metal Cooler now, that's definitely going to change a lot. Of course, Broly would probably join the fight too, although they haven't completely gotten his anger under control, so they need to make sure that's good first. Granola is stopped pretty easily and they realize that they don't need to kill him, although the heaters are an issue. Thankfully, they're able to stop the heaters amidst their plan, before they're even able to make the wish to make Gas the strongest person in the universe. The heaters are all killed pretty quickly, with Granola even joining them. This is so weird, the Saiyans here are actually good. Monado tells him that not all Saiyans were bad, and one actually did save him, but it's weird to see how these ones are actually working with him. Especially Cooler too, because he's Frieza's brother, but no, he apparently killed Frieza with good intentions. He thought that it was just a spat between the two of them, which is pretty much expected. But no, it was him actually killing Frieza because Frieza was a threat, which is weird to hear. That only shows him even more that people could change, especially people like the Saiyans. And thankfully, since the heaters already gathered the Dragon Balls, they're able to use them to counter Granola's wish. Of course, it does erase a bit of his power. That's the condition that the dragon grants. But he does keep some of the strength that he gained, as well as some other stuff too. Both of these turn out way better than they expected. Both Broly and Granola are now good. Not that they were bad to begin with, but they're all allies. It only goes to show what the effects of Cooler had on everyone, because he's pretty much the same way. They never expected him to be an ally, but look at what happened. Look at how he affected all these people. All these people whose lives were ruined by his brother, he pretty much made it right. 
everyone's now in better places, even everyone on Earth, the Saiyans especially. Not only did Cooler turn good, but he corrected all the mistakes of his brother. And in the end, he's going down a great path. Beerus recognizes that he'll be a great god of destruction soon, and he works more and more towards that, utilizing the same powers that Vegeta has. All the while, Frieza is just stuck in hell. Getting news of all of his brother's success as he just watches on, coping and seething while he's stuck in his personal hell and his cocoon. As Frieza screams in rage, this is where we'll end off this series. So, what did you guys think about this scenario? Leave any thoughts in the comments below. I'd love to see what you guys think. If you liked this video, be sure to drop a like. If you haven't already, why not subscribe? As well as hitting the bell icon to be notified about any future uploads on my channel, including more videos like this one, or maybe more parts of the series in the future. Anyways, thank you all for watching, thanks for supporting this scenario, and I'll see you all in my next video.